Now on BBC Two, David Dimbleby introduces live coverage of the Chancellor's budget. Labour is promoting this budget as one of the most significant events of this Parliament. Gordon Brown promising a budget for the poor which won't harm the better off in a radical reform of the welfare state. This afternoon we'll see whether what he does matches up to what he's promised. I'm in Swansea to find out how new Labour economics is going down in a traditionally old Labour territory. I'll be talking to young mothers both in and out of work to find out what Gordon Brown can do for them and everyone else here in South Wales. And I'm at the Standard Life Building in Edinburgh's financial district, where after all the rumours surrounding the budget, the markets are keenly awaiting the Chancellor's speech. I'll be joined by representatives from industry, the unions and the financial sector. I'll be here at the House of Commons, taking you through events in the chamber during the Chancellor's speech. And we'll be getting reaction from key politicians on all sides of the House. Welcome to the BBC's brand new budget time, where we'll be testing the impact of the Chancellor's new measures Huddled round the square, shops, offices, services, banks and so on, waiting to see what Gordon Brown has rolling into town. But this is essentially a budget about families, and so we've ranged along one side of the square, a whole bunch of families and various levels of income. Actually, they're sitting at home watching us now. Uh, this is George and Marie Hyam, for example. Hello, George. Hello, Marie. We'll, we'll, be here, we'll be hearing from you later on. And as we go along that range of families there, we'll be hearing what they want from the budget, and after the Chancellor's spoken, what they think of it. Hello. Well, there'll be a lot of detail to talk about this afternoon and for us to explain so that you know exactly how the measures announced by Gordon Brown affect you. There'll also be the big picture, what the effect of his measures is on the economy, on all our prosperity, on jobs, on the National Health Service, education and all the rest of it. So there's a great deal to talk about. And I'll be helped here in London with Bridget Rosewell, who's here to explain the effect of the budget on the economy with uh, Moira Elms, who's an expert in family and personal finance, and with Andrew Dilnot, who'll be talking, among other things, about how the changes in welfare benefits will hit home. Also, from the government, we have Chris Smith, culture minister, who already knows what's in the budget, and he's not going to tell us, I'm afraid. John Redwood, who'd like to be chancellor, the Tory shadow trade secretary, and Malcolm Bruce, Liberal Democrats' treasury spokesman. Now, if you have any queries about anything you'd like to ring us about or put to these learned gentlemen and learned ladies and gentlemen on this side, ring us. Uh, this is the number, 0345 514 614. Fax us, 0171 973 6283. Or email us at west.live at bbc.co.uk. Or indeed, you can follow the whole budget and pretend to be Chancellor yourself, if you fancy that, on the BBC's website. There's the number on the screen. Down at the House of Commons at the moment, rather thinly populated benches as Donald Dewar takes Scottish questions and then there are going to be some questions about the Lord Chancellor's department, uh, perhaps a few about wallpaper. And Gordon Brown will stand up at 3.30 for the budget proper. Hugh Edwards is outside number 11. We're waiting for the Chancellor to come out. What about this budget then? There seems to be an awful lot of kerfuffle about what is and isn't in it right up to the last minute, Hugh. Well, that's true, David. By the way, we're expecting Mr. Brown any minute, any second indeed, to emerge from number 11 to make his way over to the House. Yes, lots of leaks or supposed leaks from this budget. One thing is clear, David, one of the steers we were given this morning, if I can call it that, Mr. Brown apparently will not be announcing today that child benefit, for example, will be taxed for those on higher incomes. That was one fear of many Labour MPs, worrying that middle Britain, as they call it, would be suffering perhaps more than it should do in this budget. But is that a true steer or a false steer? I think that's probably a true steer because I think it's got the smack of Downing Street behind it and uh, indeed it makes sense. Mr. Blair, I think, is acting as the, uh, the man who's tempering Mr. Brown's radical instincts. But you talk about the smack of, uh, of number 10 about it. I mean, that is exactly what we're told has been happening. Gordon Brown posing as the radical chancellor wanting to lead the Labour Party one way and uh, the Prime Minister saying, no, no, that's much too far and too fast. Is that, well, is that a fair Well, well let, me, let me give you the, 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 the more positive gloss, David, which is that um, they see Mr. Brown certainly as a man who deserves his a tag as a radical chancellor, and he will hope to prove it today, but Mr. Blair is seen as the man who's rather more populist and pragmatic. I think Mr. Brown's actually coming out now, David, so let's just have a look at the scene. Here he is, surrounded by his ministerial team. Alistair Darling there on the left, Dawn Primarolo, and then... Uh, Gordon Brown, obviously, with the big red box, the new red box in the middle, 
and uh, Helen Liddell and Geoffrey Robinson, of course, the uh, Paymaster General there on the other wing. Uh, Mr. Brown smiling broadly, David, and uh, he looks like a man who's uh, quite relaxed with, uh, with what's going on. Well, now, what's all this about it being the defining budget and uh, a radical budget and the most important event of this Parliament? Well, as he makes his way, David, I think what's interesting here is to ask ourselves, as you say, what is meant by this radical budget? And I think, you know, we do need to look at what you referred to earlier as the big picture. What Mr. Brown is going to try and do today is quite ambitious. He's going to try and change the way people think about benefits and about welfare and about taxation. Now, that's no mean feat. He wants to change the way millions of people on low incomes actually think about the concept of earning money, either via benefits or work. And he's hoping that by transferring lots of the benefits paid, in his words, through the pay packet in his new regime, people will think that the work ethic that work actually pays. They won't actually think that it's worth staying on benefits and that that will be worth more for them. They'll actually want to go out and earn some money. So okay. if you can change the way millions of people think, I think it's fair to say that that would indeed be a radical departure. Uh, Chris Smith, Mr. Uh, Brown now Chris is Smith, uh, making you were in, his way you were in the uh, this morning. Treasury gate there, um, and, You uh, know what's in this budget uh, as the Chancellor goes off. Um, every budget and every Chancellor tries to put a gloss on his budget before it happens. Is this justified, this notion? I mean, what is this about it being the biggest thing since the budgets of the 80s and sliced bread and 101 other things. I mean, I, I think it will be a very radical budget, um, uh, but it'll also be a prudent budget. Uh, it's, um, I, I think I'm not giving any secrets away if I say that uh, uh, he's not going to be uh, uh, acting as Father Christmas today. But what he will be doing is putting in place, I believe, some very substantial changes to the way in which the benefit system and the tax system interact. But That's been a I, constant yeah. theme which uh, Gordon has been uh, pursuing over the whole of the last year and uh, he now has a chance, having reflected, having worked up his proposals, he now has a chance to do something serious well, about Why it. is there this obsession with getting mothers to go to work instead of staying at home and looking after their children? I mean, that seems to be what's behind all the things we hear about the budget. Mm, it's not uh, so much an obsession with getting mothers to go to work, it's uh, an obsession with with uh, making work pay. Uh, it's uh, ensuring uh, that people have real incentives to go to work uh, because that's good for the economy, it's good for them, it's the only sensible way to lift people out of poverty. And uh, at the moment, of course, the whole tax and benefit system has in it a lot of traps and obstacles uh, that make it actually rather difficult for people to go to okay, work. Well, we'll no doubt hear much more about that later on. Um, let's go over to Peter Snow and see that uh, much vaunted budget town, Peter, and maybe you'll take us through some of the things you'll be talking about. <clears throat> yeah, David, and it's actually the second time that uh, Gordon Brown has brought his budget bus rolling into town, but nobody doubts, as you were saying, you were saying, all those people saying, that this is a great opportunity to reform tax and benefits so as to change people's attitude to work. Now, to look at the Chancellor's options in this budget, we've had our designers dream up a quite new budget town for us so that we can visit all the familiar watering places the Chancellor always goes to. Let's start with the poor old off-license. And here on the window here is the price list that this evening may well be showing that alcohol is up a touch, the half a pint, perhaps penny a pint, and wine up five pence a bottle, roughly with inflation. They went up in January, so you can't do too much to drink. The tobacconist will take much heavier punishment next door. Here's this pink Price list here, cigarettes. Well, five pence a pack, it might be roughly par for the course for the Chancellor. They went up in December. He might double that, put them up 10p a pack. Smokers are in for a pasting uh, in this budget. There's no question about that. Now, already estate agents are posting the fact that mortgage interest relief is to go down from 15% to 10% in effect from April. He might just go a bit further than that and abolish it altogether. He's moving that way anyway. That'll give him two billion quid to spend on something else. Then the garage next door, it's bound to be bad news for drivers. Let's bring out now the list of prices for the garage from this evening, perhaps five pence a litre. He's committed a 6% uh, rise in real terms in petrol over the year. Uh, he's going to have to put it, up, put it up last July. It's going to have to go up uh, again this time. Moving along now to look at companies again. Uh, Company cars are going to take a pasting almost certainly as well. The car charges could go up. Uh, the tax on company cars, therefore, it could go up. He might even charge people for parking free in the office, and they'd say they should pay tax for that. This budget, of course, is about spending as well. Who knows? You may find the uh, chemist tomorrow boasting that there's a little more money to be spent on national health. More money to cut NHS waiting lists, perhaps as much as a billion pounds more spending on health. But the real centre and focus of this budget is on getting people out of work, into work. And here we have the our tiny tots, uh, children's 
uh, children's nursery in town. He may, for the first time, produce a new childcare credit for up to £75 a week that would actually be cash in mothers' pockets so that they could spend it on childcare, not just uh, say that they've got this allowance here, there and elsewhere, but actually have the cash to do it. We've heard Hugh Edwards tell us the child benefit uh, won't be taxed. Mr Blair seems to have uh, insisted on that. If that is so fine, otherwise we take the caution that, you know, sometimes leaks before the budget tend to be the opposite way around to what actually happens when it comes to making speech. So you never know what might happen there. On now to Social Security. This again is the centre of focus of his budget, and here we have benefit reform. He's going to have a new working families tax credit replacing family credit. The credit will be in the wage packet rather than the benefit check. Uh, we'll have more about that later. National insurance contributions have to be reduced for the low paid again. Anything to give people the incentive to go to work. National insurance costs a lot at the moment. It could be could cost less after this budget. The inland revenue, he may say, right, uh, that new starting rate of income tax will start this year. We know it's going to start sometime. He could say it'll start when it's prudent to do so. That is going to be the big unanswered question until the end of his speech. We'll know all that when he gets on his feet in something like, let's see where we are now, yeah, 35 minutes' time. David. Peter, thank you very much. Now, Moira, if uh, you were watching this as a mother with a couple of children at home and wondering what was in store for you, what would you be watching out for? And how would you expect, on the basis of what we've heard so far, your life to change? Um, I'd certainly be looking for a bit more help with childcare. Um, and, uh, and hopefully some extra benefits if, if those are appropriate and perhaps some tax cuts at the very bottom end. And would you be thinking that uh, the government wanted you back in work if you could get a job? Would you be feeling that there was a kind of pressure on you or would you take Chris Smith's line that it's just there as an option if you wanted? I think most people would probably say they, they'd at least go and inquire about work if there are further incentives given. And what kind of families is it that are going to benefit from this? if these measures are taken? I mean, is it single mothers especially, or is it uh, the very poorest families, or the very largest families, or what? Yeah. In general, I would say it's, it's probably going to be the, the single parents and the, uh, the couples with, um, with perhaps low earnings, um, the, probably the bottom 10% of families in the country. Okay, Andrew, what would you be looking out for if you were watching this and thinking, how am I going to be affected? Well, I think the childcare thing will be a, a very important element in it. I think national insurance contribution changes, we had those twice in the 1980s, I think we could well see some changes there and that might help employers who take on low paid people. And then there are some changes on the savings regime, we've heard already about individual savings accounts back in December, that caused an enormous fuss and I think the Chancellor has almost certainly to step back a little from some of the initial proposals, so I think the final details on that will be important. What do you make of all these leaks we've had? There seem to have been more leaks this time than, than ever before. Well, I think leaks have become devalued. When we only had two or three leaks a year, we, we had some <laughs> idea that some of them might be true. Now there are so many, we have no idea whether we should take any of them seriously. OK, let's, have a, let's just have a look at the, at the, at the state of the economy generally, because that's the other side of all this. We talk about the detail, but the general picture and the effect the Chancellor has on that is just as important in the end, whether you have a job, how inflation goes, what your pay packet has in it. And there's always argument about how well the economy is doing, whether it needs a little encouragement or whether it needs a little cooling down. We'll be talking about the kind of suitable treatment for the economy in a moment. But let's see, first of all, this report on some people who aren't doing too well, as they see it at the moment, and some who think things are going OK. From the BBC's economics editor, Peter Jay. For a century and a half, they've been building boats at Moody's Yard on the River Hamble in Hampshire but they may not even make it into the next century if help doesn't arrive soon. There's no lack of boats in the marina. Boat owners have money to spend, but they're buying their boats from French and German builders because the strong pound makes British boats too expensive. And my biggest fear is that our industry is going the same way as the British car industry did. The Bank of England doesn't seem to want to understand uh, that, uh, that the strong pound is affecting our home market, which is very important to us. Down the road at Portsmouth, Raytheon is caught in the same squeeze. They make radar, chart plotters and autopilots for pleasure boats. But the strong pound is killing their mainly export business. The government uh, doesn't seem to have any other agenda than keeping inflation down, which uh, really has uh, caused us huge problems with regard to uh, trying to keep our products competitive. And I suppose at the end of the day, we see this leading to uh, a severe recession pound is expensive because interest rates are high and that's because of what is going on here for example at Southampton's new leisure world complex 
I would say it compares very favorably with what I've seen in the past, particularly the, the late 80s, which was a, was a boom time. Um, I would say at the moment the, the, there is a lot of confidence in people spending it within the leisure market. Memories of Nigel Lawson's boom give the Bank of England the heebie-jeebies, having ended in such a nasty smash. Driving the economy is a bit like driving a heavy lorry with a badly connected steering wheel. Ahead stretches the Chancellor's yellow brick road, the straight and narrow route along which the economy ought to be driven. Back in 1990, when John Major was Chancellor, he was trying so hard to escape rising prices that he shot right over the yellow brick road deep into recession. After Black Wednesday in 1992, Norman Lamont was able to steer back towards the yellow brick road as recovery from the recession began. Under Ken Clark, recovery stalled for a while. But as the election came over the horizon, he got back closer to the yellow brick road and business got better. After the election, Gordon Brown passed the steering wheel to the Bank of England, who steered sharply away from rising prices, heading the economy back down towards harder times. The Cascade shopping mall in the Portsmouth town centre is just the setting for the consumer spending binge, which scares the Bank of England into jacking up interest rates. Spending did rise fast last year and interest rates went up five times. But are there yet enough big spenders to fuel a genuine boom? No, I don't think they're in a spend-spend mood. I think they're very much in a cautious mood where they're prepared to buy things that they need but within certain financial limits. The cult group up the road at Havant, where they make ventilation and air handling equipment for sale around the world, is another of the places we visited where the Bank of England also sends its scouts to take the pulse of industry. But here, as elsewhere, we were told that the man from Threadneedle Street seemed to have difficulty getting the message. We have a representative from the Bank of England visit us from time to time here in uh, Hampshire, but I suspect they're after a free lunch. And even if the Chancellor's ears are any more open to the victims of high interest rates of the strong pound, it no longer lies within his power just to stand up and order things otherwise. The government will continue to set the inflation target and the bank will have responsibility for setting interest rates to meet the target. The Titanic sailed on her only voyage from here, Southampton docks, and the ship commanded by Gordon Brown also faces large hazards which could rip the bottom out of his whole strategy for a rapid transition to American-style economic growth. If interest rates stay high and the pound stays strong and the economy sinks into recession next year, his plans for getting the unemployed back to work and off the backs of the taxpayer will go to the bottom. Somehow his budget has to persuade the Bank of England that they can start cutting interest rates this summer. There is just one way he might try to do this. The great question in every budget is how much should the Treasury borrow in the coming budget year? If the Chancellor spends the same next year as this year and makes no tax changes, he'll need to borrow about two and a half billion pounds. But that takes credit for 1.4 billion from his windfall tax, which he promised not to count. So he's really borrowing 3.9 billion. Gordon Brown promised before the election that he wouldn't borrow more than he invested after reinvesting any privatization receipts. That golden rule puts a ceiling of about eight and a half billion pounds on what he can borrow. So, taking 3.9 billion away from eight and a half billion to calculate the Chancellor's kitty, he could in theory cut taxes or increase spending by just over four and a half billion pounds. Only last month, the Bank of England warned that further interest rate rises were still in the wind. By holding on to that four and a half billion pound kitty, the Chancellor may hope, fingers crossed, to bring the Bank of England round. Well, that was Peter Jay's view. Bridget Rosa, what do you make of it? Do you think that uh, it's time for interest rates to come down, or well, at least be held? I think what, what we have to remember here is that this is not a budget in which interest rates can be changed. That responsibility has been given to the Monetary Policy Committee. And indeed, what Gordon Brown said in November and previously was that he wanted to go, the budgetary process was about the medium and the long term, and he won't actually be making a judgment in this budget as to whether the economy should be squeezed. Yeah, but or what he does is going to affect the B Bank of England. That's the problem, yes, that no, nothing that you do on taxing, taxes or spending is, um, doesn't affect the short term at the same time. So I think the difficulty will be in listening to this budget is to get a view from it as to what he actually thinks should be happening to the economy because I think he'll want to avoid the question. And what he will therefore probably do is take a course 
to use the analogy from the film just now, that is, I feel like, Titanic, steady as she goes. <laughs> well, as steady as she goes, rather than and hope that the icebergs are pushed out of the way by the bank. And what's your judgment of it? I do think you think economy, we're heading for trouble, or do you think things are going I well? I think the economy is actually beginning to slow down. I think that uh, we've, we know that there are all these problems with the manufacturing sector, with high interest rates and high exchange rates. We know as well, I think, we're beginning to see the signs that consumers are feeling the pinch from mortgage interest rate increases. Those didn't come through until the beginning of the year. You can begin to see that on the high street as well. So yes, there are bits of the economy that are doing quite well, but they are they're getting smaller and smaller bits. And I think that it could be quite a nasty and crunch. And just one other thing, what would you say to all these people, businessmen, industrialists, the farmers and people who say that the pound is so high that their businesses are suffering, and to the people who work in those industries and manufacturing. It is clearly true, that's right. Is it there is no way of looking true. after them as well as getting the unless, consumer side right? Unless you believe that uh, policy should be directed towards the exchange rate as well as to interest rates, and at the moment we have a policy a statement which says short-term policy <coughs> is through interest rates, and that is the way that it is done. Long-term policy is fiscal policy and is things which help more people get back into work, dealing with poverty and so on. And the exchange rate is actually nowhere in that conundrum. Unless they take this exchange rate seriously, it is going to stay up there. OK, let's take a telephone call. We've got three politicians here who will be eager to answer, and you can answer the points that have been made so far as well when we do that. This one's from um, Dainton Grant, who's on the line from London. Dainton Grant, hello? Hello? Yeah, what's your question? Well, my question is, is simple. I would like to see... You have a, uh, a thing for getting the people back to work, i.e. getting the youngsters back into training and retraining and then for the older generation but what about us in the middle the 30 you know the 25 30 odd that are laid off and not put back into work for retraining and helping us out how long have you been out of work yourself four months right and you want something done for yourself ever done for you in the budget well yeah obviously i would like to see you know when you go in that something is done for us in the middle you know being 35 36 okay. you, you, we tend to get left away you know they'll, they'll go to the teenager the youngsters coming out of school and education all right and well, then john redwood on. is nodding his head in agreement with you what would you do john well i think this shows the danger of, of too much fiddling at the edges and the government may succeed in helping some young people at the expense of others what they should be doing is getting the strategy right for the economy as a whole We've seen a big betrayal already of tax promises. They've put taxes up when they said they would keep taxes where they were from the Conservative years. That is doing damage to business. Massive increase in taxes on businesses, and it's hitting individual families. The average family is about £800 a year worse off taking the mortgage changes, the tax changes together. They're also driving manufacturing into recession, as we've been hearing. A very good report from uh, those shipbuilders and others they cannot export at these levels of the pound. Why is it happening? Well, it's happening because Mr. Brown is following the wrong tax strategy and all the pressure is going on to the exchange rate as a result. So what, what would you be doing if you he were He should promote here? savings. He should say, I'm sorry, I got it wrong, taxing pensions. I'm going to promote savings. I'm going to let people save for their pensions tax-free. He should climb down over peps and testers. He should make them more generous. He should say, now is the time when I want people to save that money rather than spending it in the okay. leisure arcade that we saw. OK, Chris well, There was uh, one thing there which John got right, which, <clears throat> which is that the major focus has, of course, to be on getting the uh, medium term of the economy right. And that and we're means, talking and that about, means, of course, Dainton getting, Grant and that, his job. That means yeah. getting stable economic growth. Mm. As far as uh, Dainton Grant is concerned, he's right to raise the issue. The first uh, priority that uh, the government established with the windfall tax and the welfare to work scheme was, of course, young, uh, long-term unemployed people. Uh, but we've now extended that to long-term unemployed people over the age of 25. And I think uh, what we will also see later on uh, this afternoon uh, is some more general help for people in the uh, getting people back into work and making work pay for them once they get into work. Okay. Uh, I, I think we'll see some more general measures. Dainton Grant, what's your own experience been? Well, it, it's, uh, it's been difficult <laughs> because I want to go in and I want to retrain to do something else. But for my age group, there's no actual help there. You know, if I wanted it, I'd have to do it off my own back. There's only very little help that I could get. But if I was younger, there's more help. They give you more the more training you can go back no, to from college. What Chris Smith says, you may be hearing good news in this budget. Is that what you're saying? 
I wouldn't dream. May, of, may, I, I may, may. Dream of predicting right. what the Chancellor's going to say. Malcolm Lewis, you, his, you, his view is going to be a <coughs> wide view. It's not just going to be concentrated on people under 25. Okay, Malcolm Bruce. Well, I mean, Dainton has a problem as an individual, and he's quite right to say that all he's concerned about is what training and help he can get to get him back into a job. And I do think the government should be providing anybody who's unemployed with what they need. And it's a general comment you get. People say, I'm unemployed, and I get no help. But I think it's a, a delusion to assume that providing welfare-to-work schemes is a real way of creating jobs. I mean, in that sense, I agree with John Redwood. Only the real economy can create real jobs. And the Chancellor, by refusing to deal with the consumer boom last year and by taxing businesses and pensions, has actually put the Bank of England in a situation where they've had to put up interest rates, and that's obviously created the high exchange rate. Although I have to say, the government's position in relation to the single currency has added an, a, a, a twist to that that's made it even worse. OK, let's take another message. We have an email from David Argus from South Wales, who earns £3.12 an hour, travels 30 miles to work every day, and is worried about fuel cost and car tax going up. That's likely to happen, isn't it? I think it's very likely to happen. I think the, the cost of fuel <coughs> rise, that's been pre-announced. It was pre-announced by the last government. The new government has taken it still further. There's also a chance that we might see other changes, perhaps moving to a graduated vehicle excise duty, so that if his car has got rather a small engine, he pays less, but if it's a large engine, he pays more. I think motoring is going to be hit in the budget. And, uh, and what's the effect on a man on £3.12 an hour going to be? Well, the effect of work. It'll be the opposite of, exactly the opposite of what the Chancellor well, It certainly is the case that one of the problems with almost all environmental taxes is that most of the things that cause pollution, if we raise the price of them, it also help, hurts poor people more than it hurts the better off. Now, that was a problem with VAT on fuel. Putting VAT on fuel was a very green measure, but it hurt poor people. Now, the last government did announce a compensation package. It would be interesting to see whether the Labour Party announced a compensation package for poor people if they increase the taxes. Because one, one of the great lines we've been spun is that the, it's going to be a budget that helps the poor without hitting the middle classes. In fact, the Prime Minister was said to be very irritated or worried that the budget would look as though it was against those people in the middle classes who voted for Blair. Is it possible? Is it possible to help one lot without hurting the other, Moira? It's, um, it's going to be very difficult. If he doesn't want to be acting Father Christmas, then um, if he gives on the one hand, he's got to take it back somewhere else. OK. Mary Whiting from Blackpool's on the line. Mary Whiting. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, <coughs> what I'd like to see is if the Chancellor would leave Maris in place for mortgages up to £30,000. And uh, do, do you have one of these? Yes, our mortgage is just under 28,000 and we're old age pensioners on a fixed income. And we couldn't have a mortgage until my husband was made redundant when he was nearly 70. So we have an interest only mortgage and the capital has to be repaid when we both die, basically. Are there many people in that predicament? Um, there are a large number of people in that predicament and there's, you know, there, one of the um, previous changes to um, the mortgage relief uh, system is just going to hit people from April. Um, so they're already going to find that on a 30,000 mortgage they're 10 or 11 pounds a month, month worse off. Um, so if, it's, if uh, Myris was taken away completely that's going to be another 20 or so pounds each month. What would happen to you, Mary Whiting, if that, uh, if that happened? We just have to find the money and pay it, do without something else. On top of the fact that our mortgage is only reviewed, reviewed once a year, was reviewed last June, so we've got five rises to cope with this coming June. OK, thank you very much. We've got an email here from um, Nigel Street in Swindon who says he has a well-paid job. His wife looks after their two children, but the increasing tax burden may force children into daycare mm. and the wife into a job which she doesn't want. What do you say to that, Chris Smith? Uh, well, it's precisely people in that sort of uh, position uh, that the Chancellor is going to have very much in mind uh, in the, announcement he makes, uh, the announcements he makes this afternoon. Uh, his intention this afternoon uh, is to have a budget which encourages people either to get into or to stay in work and that also helps families, particularly families with children. Uh, and those, I think, w you will find are going to be the two uh, underlying motifs of this budget alongside a desire also to help British enterprise. So you're which, saying that a man uh, with a well-paid job whose wife stays at home looking after two children is not going to find his tax burden go up as a result of this afternoon's budget? Well, I'm not going to predict yeah, but I mean, that's what, what you, you he, said. I'm, the, I'm not going to predict what he's going to find. Well, all right, but he's but, thinking but, about this but, kind of person. I think people in that sort of position are very much in the Chancellor's mind. John Redwood? Well, we're very worried that he might invent a scheme which made it more worthwhile to look after somebody else's children than to look after your own, because there have been all sorts of ideas of subsidising people to provide childcare 
uh, in a way that uh, could hit those who are staying at home and looking after their own children. So I hope the Chancellor will take into account both groups of people, those who do want to work and those who wish to be at home as mother or father and provide the loving care at home for those children. Your, your, your party leader sits in committee with the Prime Minister um, so presumably the Liberal Democrats get their way on these issues. What have you been saying on this? And you, well, have you I'm, won the day? I'm not aware that the committee discusses any of these issues. It's but you're there. Commission. You could. You could. Well, you've got a bit of influence. The committee is on constitutional affairs. I think that the, the the point at issue is that I have asked repeatedly government ministers whether they're in favour of mothers in particular staying at home with preschool age children as a matter of choice and I have to say not one government minister has been prepared to answer that question which I think is a disgrace yeah. and, and I think the, uh, but the interesting thing on the issue of mortgages is that we as a party suggested that the mortgage relief should wither on the vine what I think is very unfair is that the Tories started it and Labour are continuing it is that what they're doing is taking away a tax relief that people built into their budget when they took out a mortgage mm. well you're nodding John but you started it mm. and the Labour Party are continuing it and the reality is people do have to make budgets about housing and when governments blithely just take these taxes away what you're, what you're being told is exactly right they've got to take the money from somewhere but else. Do you, but what we do didn't do, do was do it at a time oh, no, when interest rates just, were going up. Okay. They, they are getting hit twice by this Labour government because they're losing tax relief much more than we'd have taken away and putting the mortgage do rates you, up at the same time. Hold on, do you, do you, just one thing, do you ever say to your party leader get out of bed with Blair because I keep getting this stick from Labour people on the economy, on tax, and all the things that really matter to people. So forget the constitutional thing. Let's pull out and withdraw from cooperation with Labour. What, by Labour? Or yeah, by us? with Labour. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I think that I, get, I hear irritation, I may say, from government members who say, why are we doing business with the Liberal Democrats? The answer is they're doing business with the Liberal Democrats because we have a common agenda on the Constitution. But constructive opposition means you can differ and robustly okay. differ. Okay, let's go down to Hugh Edwards outside the House of Commons now, having stepped smartly over from number 11. Hugh, you got more news on this budget or reaction? to what may be in it. Just a quick uh, update for you, yeah. David. I've just been in the members' lobby, just chatting to a few people who, by the way, should know by now what's in the package. One of them certainly knew the whole package. Um, just to tell you that uh, there will certainly be what he called a decent amount of extra money for health. More money, too, for schools, but less money for schools, less of an addition there than, than there will be for health. Mr Brown, I'm told, will repay what he called a large chunk of the national debt. He will adjust some of the rules to do with lone parent benefit. You remember there was a kind of trap for people who actually started work and then stopped quickly again. They fell foul of the rules. He'll tighten that up. And finally, David, just a little hint here about the big uh, element of compulsion. Compulsion to work, that is, for people who uh, don't take up benefits options and training options when they're on benefits. Um, apparently, he'll hint at that after the budget itself has been delivered. But the welfare to work thing certainly has been seen here as MPs by MPs as the big signal that this is a new Labour budget. One or two concerns by the way, that it won't be seen as one that's actually delivering practical, realistic objectives for people who are on low incomes. But we'll have to judge that when we get the speech. But on the whole, pretty positive. Thanks very much. Twelve minutes until the Chancellor starts his budget. Let's go down to Swansea and join Diana Medill. Diana. Hello again from Wales' second city, which lies between the industrial east and the rural west of the Principality. Now, as you've been saying, this is very much a budget which is being trailed heavily for women and children. So we've got a working mother here, amongst others, and children here in Swansea. Marie Gillespie, childcare is still the main concern for working mothers. A crucial issue, yes. I think uh, especially more, more equal access to childcare, especially for poorer mothers, and better quality childcare, especially in the public sector. It appears the Chancellor has ruled out taxing child benefit for richer families. Do you think that's a good idea? Um, it would probably cost more to administer than the intended gains and as a matter of principle I don't think that women or ch uh, mothers or children should be deprived of any resources. Okay Marie, well we'll hear what you and the other working mothers have to say after Gordon Brown has given a speech. But welfare to work is very much one of the key issues for Labour and the economy. Neil Jenkins is on a pilot scheme here in South Wales. How well is that working? It's working quite well, really. It's given me the necessary skills to broaden my horizons for the kind of jobs that I can actually apply for. And do you think you will get a full-time permanent job afterwards? I think my chances are increasing with the skills that I'm now learning. Definitely, yes. Naz Malik, now your business was put out of business because of high interest rate rises in the past. There have been five rises since Labour has come to power. Do you think that's a significant worry for a lot of business people? Uh, I think it is. I, I think it is a significant worry because uh, the, the rate of interest which is current was the rate at which we came into business and within a matter of short 18 months it tripled. 
which went up to above 20 percent. And in the matter of uh, a few years, a couple of years, we ran out of we ran into trouble and out of business. So not only urban businesses, of course, that feel the pinch from time to time, but rural businesses. Yourself, Hugh Richards, you're a farmer. There's been all this demonstration coming from the countryside. Do you think Gordon Brown has to show some sort of aspect of having listened to you? He has to listen to the protests coming up to the countryside because a major problem that we have is the strength of the pound. We've heard it so much at the start of this programme that the strength of the pound is affecting all industries. And farmers, because we're paying on an EEC basis, we, we are there, so disadvantaged from, from day one. Sucking in inputs and making our exports that, that much more uh, expensive. Let's turn to some public sector workers. Now, Marjorie Brown, you're a teacher. They were talking there just a few moments ago of more money for education. Have you seen much improvement so far? The Chancellor put down so much money last year um, to education. Some of it has started to filter through, and indeed, from the 1st of April, probably guarantee a certain level of of, of, of work in schools. It takes time to come down to schools, to the people that matter. And Wendy Evans and the Health Service, that seems to be singled out for quite a bit of money today. You must welcome that. Well, any amount of money would be welcome. Have you seen any difference from the money that they've put in so far? No. I think that there was too little for it to have any visible impact. For example, in Wales, we face a deficit of £40 million next year. All right. So Thank it's going to have to be a massive Wendy. injection. And more from Swansea in just a few minutes, of course, after Gordon Brown has given his speech. David. Thanks very much. Well, let's go from Swansea North to Edinburgh and join Anne McKenzie. Well, I'm here in the heart of Edinburgh's financial district with a collection of experts on business, finance and the unions. And uh, we're all waiting as well to put some flesh on the speculation. I'll start off with you, Bill McAuliffe, a, a city watcher and indeed de dealer and player. What in your view, is the mood of the markets? How would you gauge it? Well, I think today we've seen a buoyancy in London, certainly on the back of a very strong uh, finish on Wall Street last night. And the real economic debate is not going on today, as John Jay said earlier. The real econo economic debate is between the doves and the hawks and the Bank of England Monetary Policy Council. So I think very much we're looking for a steer of the mood of the Chancellor and the mood of the economy. Because of his PSBR uh, position, he may be in cash over the course of the next two years. The city will be looking for a very firm hand on that tiller to make sure that we're not going to go back into the situation that, say, Nigel Lawson saw at almost a decade ago. Right, Nicola Horlick, as a fund manager, what uh, are you and indeed uh, do you think individual investors looking for out of this budget? It's important for investors to know that it's going to be a stable economic environment and therefore it's important for the, for the Chancellor to do things that are not going to stimulate further inflation and so on. And so we're, we're pleased that it looks as though he's going to be fiscal, fiscally prudent and so on. But also, obviously, the big question is what's going to happen with ISAs and savings and PEPs and so on. A lot of people are waiting to hear what he has to say about that. A lot of people felt that the limit of 50,000 was the wrong limit to be set. And we want to see some stimulus to saving, which can be done by removing such a, an well, artificial limit. There are rumours only rumours, of course, that he has listened a bit on ISIS. How far would he need to go to make you happy with the new individual savings account? Well, some sort of moratorium on existing PEPs, leaving existing PEPs as they are, and then perhaps having an ISA looking forward to the future. Some people are talking about maybe having a 50,000 limit over a 10-year period would certainly be a lot better than what was suggested before. OK, Tracy White of the Scottish TUC. As we've said throughout the programme, it is one of the most leaked budgets ever, but we seem to be expecting some more money for health, some for education, help for lower-paid workers, and helping work, uh, people off benefit into work. But it seems, the rumour is at least, that no significant listening, uh, lis loosening rather, of uh, public sector spending. Is that the kind of balance that you within the unions would find uh, acceptable or desirable? Well, I think we, we um, recognise the priority areas that the government have, have set, but as far as this budget is concerned, we would be looking for um, some action to be taken um, to make a reality of the government's commitments to um, growth and to employment opportunities for all. So obviously in that respect, what's been talked about in terms of making work pay will be important. But from a Scottish context, we're already suffering here from... Um, the rate of reduction in unemployment being slower than in the rest of the con country. And in that respect, uh, some right. change to interest rate policy, uh, some impact on interest rate Andrew policy. Andrew Dury of the Scottish CBI, 
roughly would you be looking for the same kind of loosening of, of interest rate policy? As far as business is concerned, it works best in a stable environment. Uh, what we would be looking from the Chancellor is to keep a very firm grip on public spending and therefore on borrowing. Uh, in Pacifics, we'd be looking for a rethink on how advanced corporation tax is paid because that has a real effect on the cash flows of medium and small size companies. We'd be looking for some relief for entrepreneurism and companies specializing in research and development. Uh, and as a distiller, I'll be looking for a long-term review on how alcoholic right. drinks are taxed in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the moment. A taste there of the hopes of business and finance. We'll know in a few minutes if they've been realized. David. Well, we have a few minutes, four or five minutes left before the Chancellor starts the budget statement. Peter Snow was saying hello, but not much more a moment ago, to some of the families that he'll be talking to. Peter, perhaps you have a chance to have a longer word with them. Yeah, you ought to monitor this uh, budget, uh, David, and look at the way family fortunes are going as a result of what the Chancellor's measures are. We've lined up, as I said to you earlier, these seven houses on the left-hand side of the square here. And first of all, let's go visit number one. First of all, we have Bev Strange, and I think that's Liam with you, Bev, there, isn't it, in Bristol? And now Bev is a, an unemployed lone parent. Uh, there on the right, a quick checklist of uh, what her weekly situation is. 80 pounds benefits a week and bottle of wine, not that much the Chancellor can tax. Bev, what do you and Liam want from this budget? Well, I would like to see more money each week, but I think the main thing is childcare, help, cash help with childcare. Childcare is central to you, right Bev? Stay tuned and we'll come back to you after the budget and see whether he's done what he should. Now we move on to our second family up the street. This is an unemployed family again, Michael and Karen Keogh from Edinburgh. A look quickly at the sort of quickly checklist there. They're unemployed, £220 benefits a week, four pack of cigarettes, two baths of spirits and so on. Now, uh, Michael and Karen tell me, I won't have time because I don't want to miss the Chancellor, I won't have time to talk to me, but Michael tells me the crucial thing from Michael uh, is that jobs should be promoted by the Chancellor. George and Marie Hyam and Preston join us as well, uh, and their situation is that they're on £6,000 a year, five children, £150 benefits and so on. Uh, now, Marie, what do you want from the Chancellor? It's bloody hell, I'm embarrassed to be honest. Marie, what do you want from the Chancellor, in a word? I want, to, I want it to be beneficial for me to go to work rather than be better off on benefits. Right, and all that depends on what the Chancellor does about credits. Let's move up the street now just to introduce all our families before the Chancellor gets up very quickly. And here we have a uh, pensioner couple, I think. Yes, we do. We have an £11,000 a year pensioner couple from Lowestoft, Jim and Peggy Hodges. Jim tells me what's crucial to him. He drives a car, as you can see, is that petrol tax doesn't go up. Let's move up the street now and look at the house next door. And here we have, this time, we have someone, uh, Ashok Kumar and Shashi Gupta, roughly on average earnings between them. Now, here's our, their checklist of what happens to them each week. 22000 a year, that's roughly average earnings. They run a retail shop. And that brings in for them roughly the average earnings over the country as a whole. They're on child benefit, of course, and they've got packed the cigarettes, this, that, and the other. So the Chancellor could affect that with indirect tax. But Ashok, what's the crucial thing for you in this budget? Well, what I like to the Chancellor to don't increase the price for the cigarette and alcohol, and and they don't put the interest rate up for simple reason because cigarettes are coming from the continents and they are flooding the country. So putting the price up is not really helping. I mean, you know, it's just losing the revenue itself. And, and then getting somebody to look after, so you know, those smugglers, it, 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 it's spending more money on it. So it would now, seriously da damage, right. stop the cigarettes. It would damage, damage the retail business then if the Chancellor puts up it, it, tax it, it, on it, cigarettes it, and drinks. It, 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 okay, yeah, let, we'll let's move on. We'll, Ashok, we'll come back to you. Let's, let's move on up the street now and look at the next house, a rather better off family, £35,000 a year this time. And here we have from Leicester, uh, David and Elizabeth Winterton, here's the details of what their weekly checklist looks like. The hefty child benefit, three children, 20 cigarettes, buy and so on, two cars. Quite a lot of indirect tax potential there for the Chancellor. Uh, David, in a word, what do you want from the Chancellor? They're saying it's uh, making work pay. Well, let's make work pay. Let's get some, in some tax in incentives and uh, move up pay? the tax thresholds. Pay? For the lower paid and for the higher paid. Okay, you know, quickly, up to the last house now. Sorry to cut you off, David. The chance is about to get his feet. We don't want to miss him. And here we have a £100,000 a year uh, couple. And this is in Newcastle, Alan and Michelle Finch. There they are. There's a checklist of what they have two children too. Alan, in a word, what do you want from the Chancellor? Well, basically, not to target the obvious. Uh, putting petrol up for, uh, for individuals and uh, not to make it difficult for uh, company car drivers because uh, too much petrol pricing means that it's going to have a knock-on effect 
through courage, etc., etc. Thank you very much indeed. Well, we're going to come back to all of them, we hope, after the budget and see what they make of the Chancellor's measures in the light of what they've told us there. Uh, the Chancellor very soon on his feet. David. Peter, thanks very much. Um, um, a quick rush round the square, but we'll have a bit more time perhaps after the budget when we talk to those people in detail about the measures and how they're affected by them. Now let's go over to the House of Commons and join Carolyn Quinn. Carolyn, good afternoon. Hello, and uh, we're at the end of questions to the MP representing the Lord Chancellor in the Commons. Well, bodies have been squeezing into this uh, Commons chamber for the last 10 minutes or so. Every available seat's taken. Some MPs have even opted for a bird's eye view in the gallery above us. Well, Gordon Brown himself came into the chamber a short while ago, and the Conservative leader, William Hay, has taken his place opposite. There's always interest, of course, in what the Chancellor will drink during the hour or so he's going to have on his feet. And uh, last time Mr Brown indulged in Highland Spring mineral water. Uh, we don't yet know what he's going to drink. We should find out any minute now. The uh, Speaker now leaving the chair because uh, during these financial matters, she can't sit in the chamber and preside over this sort of debate. Uh, the seat will now be taken by the deputy Before speaker, and uh, he's explaining now what will happen procedurally. I remind them that at the end of the Chancellor's speech, copies of the budget resolutions will be available to honourable members in the vote office. Mr Chancellor of the Exchequer. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker. Only once in a generation is the tax system fundamentally reformed. The budget I bring before the House and the country today begins the task not just of modernising taxation, but modernising the entire tax and benefit system of our country. And we do this to encourage enterprise, to reward work, to support families, to advance the ambitions not just of the few, but of the many. For, for decades, under governments of both parties, the great economic strengths of our country have been undermined by deep-seated structural weaknesses, instability, underinvestment, unemployment. So behind the detailed measures of this budget is the conviction that we must break for good from the conflicts and the dogmas that have held us back and have for too long failed our country. We must build a national economic purpose around new ambitions for Britain. First, stability. We must break from our history of stop-go and the false trade-offs between unemployment and inflation. The new ambition for our country is long-term economic strength and stability based on an unshakable commitment to monetary and fiscal rules. Secondly, enterprise. Instead of punishing success by high taxation or offering the incentive of low taxation to only a few, the new ambition is a tax system that ensures that work always pays, that encourages skills, that rewards enterprise and entrepreneurship throughout the whole economy. Third, welfare reform. The new ambition for Britain is a modern welfare state that instead of trapping people in poverty, provides opportunity for all. And fourth, strong public services. Instead of simply defending unreformed public services or denigrating them simply for being public, the new ambition is to have modern schools and hospitals in an environment where investment and reform go hand in hand. So this will be a new Labour budget that demonstrates that a modern government with new ambition for Britain can advance both enterprise and fairness and can advance them together that by rewarding work and rewarding work at every level, everyone and not just one section of society succeeds. It is a budget to advance the ambition of all. Now, first, stability. By spring last year, with consumer demand already rising by 5%, the money supply by 11%, but industrial production by only 1.5%, the economy was exhibiting the same symptoms of instability from policy error that produced the boom-bust economy of the late 1980s. To avoid a lurch backwards towards the conditions that led to interest rates as high as 15% in the late 80s, the government and then the Bank of England took action to ensure stability. And I followed this tightening of monetary policy by putting in place a tough five-year deficit reduction plan. 
Last November, I was able to report that I was more optimistic that the economy was on course to get back on track for sustainable growth. That remains my view. But I also warned that there were risks ahead. On the one hand, the effects on the world economy of turbulence in Asian financial markets, and on the other, the domestic risk that an unaffordable rise in wage inflation would lead to higher interest rates and slower growth. These risks remain. A deteriorating situation in Asia has forced all governments to revise downwards the forecast for growth. And while this government has contributed to swift international action, continuing uncertainties in Asia require continuing vigilance. Similar vigilance is also required at home in the face of inflationary pressures. In the last few months, wage settlements have risen, even in the manufacturing sector, where I fully recognize that a strong pound makes life difficult for exporters. Our aim is a stable and competitive pound over the medium term, and I know that exporters agree with me that we must avoid any return to stop gold. It would not be right to sacrifice long-term goals in the face of short-term pressures. No one should be in any doubt about this government and the Bank of England's determination to meet our inflation target. And I can now report that because of the action already taken, inflation which we, when we came to power was heading well above our target into 4% is now forecast to peak at 3% this year and be at our target of 2.5% next year. And, and, and it is because we have established a sound long-term framework and the expectation of low inflation that long-term interest rates have come down substantially from over 7.5% just before the election to below 6% now, the lowest rate for 33 years. Now, growth this year and next will crucially depend on what happens to wage inflation over the coming year. It would be the worst of short-termism to pay ourselves more today at the cost of higher interest rates, fewer jobs, and slower growth tomorrow. All of us must therefore show greater responsibility. And if our welfare reforms can be complemented by responsibility across the economy, we could achieve 2.5% growth this year. But if wage bargaining proceeds in the same short-termist way as in the past, then growth this year could slow to 2%. Similarly, growth could be between 1 and 3 quarters and 2 and a quarter percent next year. And as the economy returns to its sustainable path, growth could be between 2 and a quarter and 2 and 3 quarter percent in 2000. Stability also requires a commitment to prudence in fiscal policy. The Chancellor is, above all, the guardian of the people's money. Last year, last year, last year, last year, spending, last year, spending exceeded revenues by £23 billion pounds under the last government. And when we came into power, we inherited not only a cyclical deficit, but also a substantial structural deficit in excess of 2% of national income. And immediate action was required to secure long-term deficit reduction. The five-year deficit reduction plan I put in place last July is not only on track, but it is being achieved more quickly than expected. A substantial fiscal tightening has been achieved this year with borrowing coming down by more than £17 billion, pounds, over 2% of national income. And because at this stage of the cycle it is important to come down on the side of caution, my budget will lock in this fiscal tightening for 1998-1999. So even if we exclude the windfall tax revenues, borrowing which the last government had planned at £19 billion for this year is now expected to be five billions. Oh. A, fall, a fall from 3% of national income last year under the previous government to around a half percent this year, comfortably within the Maastricht criterion. <laughs> on, the, on the same basis, borrowing is expected to fall to just under 4 billion in 1998-1999. By 2000, the budget is forecast to be in balance. But our fiscal objectives are more long-term. To meet the golden rule that over the cycle government revenues will cover consumption 
and to keep debt at a stable and prudent level. Now, pre previous governments have made the mistake, most recently in the late 80s, of claiming they had solved our deficit problem when all they had was a short-term surplus. Surpluses in 1988 and 89 collapsed into a deficit approaching 50 billion pounds in just four years, the biggest deficit in our history. Yeah. What was claimed to be the end of one crisis turned out to be only the beginning of the next. And we are determined to avoid such mistakes. Yeah. To balance the budget for one or two years and then to let it run out of control in the years that follow is simply to fail those who depend on public services being sustained year in, year out. So this, more than ever, is the wrong time to be complacent or in any way to compromise our commitment to long-term fiscal stability. And just as we locked in our commitment to sound money through reform with the Bank of England, it is now time to lock in a framework which guarantees sound finance. Our code of fiscal stability will place a duty on this government, on future governments, to report to Parliament on a consistent basis and provide full explanatory information on how it is meeting the fiscal rules it has set. Stability and prudence, they are merely the preconditions of success, but they are the platform from which success can be built. And it is time now to show similar ambition in the pursuit of long-term increases in productivity. Now, for years as a nation, our capacity to consume has not been matched by our capacity to produce. It's because we have had insufficient capacity to sustain anything other than low long-term rates of growth that our upturns have been too short and too fragile, our downturns too deep and destructive. But with a platform of stability in place and with lower long-term interest rates, I believe we are now in a position to establish for the first time for decades a virtuous circle of low inflation, high investment and higher levels of sustainable growth. And over the next few years, we must seize this opportunity by challenging ourselves to lift our productivity in each and every industry towards the level of the world's best. I want us to be as determined to raise our productivity as we, ha as we have been tough-minded about the need for stability. Now, breaking free from the old ideas of state control on the one hand, crude laissez-faire on the other, our new ambition for Britain must be to encourage enterprise and entrepreneurship, to boost education and skills, and as our competition bill will ensure to open markets to competition, in other words, to implement for our country a medium-term strategy for growth. So first then, our proposals to help business invest and grow. To encourage long-term investment, we will put in place today the company tax reform we started last year by abolishing one tax in its entirety. From April next year, companies will no longer have to pay advanced corporation tax. A new instalment system of payment for larger companies' corporation tax will be introduced. In the last budget, we reduced the main rate of corporation tax by 2 pence to 31 pence. In this budget, we reduce it by another 1 pence from April 99 to 30 pence. This is the lowest main rate of corporation tax of any major industrialized country. It is the lowest rate in the history of corporation tax in Britain. When it is finally in place, companies will pay one and a half billion less in corporation tax each year. This is the lower and fairer tax regime to encourage investment that business has wanted for years is now in place under a Labour government and it will contribute to making Britain the best place in the industrialized world in which to invest. Yeah. Businesses need to plan for the long term, so today I make a commitment for the rest of this parliament, corporation tax will be at 30 pence or less. Now stability is important, not least in our North Sea oil industry, where planning horizons are long, and next month also we will publish a consultative document on the future of the North Sea fiscal regime. In the new economy, however, jobs will come not simply from having a small number of large businesses, but a large number of small and growing businesses. So today we will make five changes that will help small businesses. We will cut the costs of investing. We will cut the burden of red tape. We will promote research and innovation. We will increase the rewards for doing well, and we will cut
tax. Now, first, following the consultation on our corporate tax proposals, I will exempt medium as well as small size companies from paying corporation tax by installments, and taken together with the abolition of advanced corporation tax, this will improve the cash flow for small and medium sized companies in our country paying dividends by about one billion pounds. But I want to do more. 85% of tax paying companies in our country, 350,000 companies, are covered by the small companies rate of tax. In the last budget, I cut the small companies rate from 23 pence to 21 pence. And I have now decided to go further. From April next year, small companies tax will be cut again to 20 pence. And we will also keep the, the rate at this level or below, not just for a year, but for the parliament. Yeah. We are not only cutting the tax rate, but cutting also the costs of investing. For 12 months from July, first year capital allowances for small and medium sized businesses will be set at 40%, continuing our commitment to boosting long-term investment. I want to make it easier and cheaper for small businesses also to take on their first employees, but setting up payroll systems costs money and time to these businesses. So from April next year, the Inland Revenue will offer businesses help in setting up their payroll systems and do so on a nationwide basis. For too long, the great scientific advances of British universities have gone on to become, unfortunately, the manufacturing successes not of Britain, but of rival countries. So to help turn British inventions into success for British business, I'm announcing today plans for a new £50 million venture capital fund open to all universities, a new university challenge fund that will invest today in the innovative businesses that will create wealth and jobs in our country yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Encouraging greater research and development investment is also crucial to higher productivity. So this government is today publishing a consultative document <coughs> indicating a determination to help business achieve greater research and development. Our venture capital industry is proportionately much smaller than that in America. But by merging the enterprise investment scheme and capital gains tax reinvestment relief, I am now able to provide more generous, more efficient, and better targeted help to encourage the venture capital industry in Britain. I propose a 50% rise in tax reliefs. From now on, investors will be able to secure income tax reliefs for investment up to £150,000 a year. But we must also do more to increase the quantity and quality of long-term investment. The capital gains tax regime we inherited rewards the short-term speculator as much as the committed long-term investor. So it is time also for a fundamental reform of capital gains tax. Yeah. In a low inflation environment, a complex system of index indexation is no longer necessary. Indexation will continue until April 1998 and will then be frozen. The annual exempt amount will rise in line with prices. And following extensive consultation, I've decided to phase out complex allowances and instead will introduce a new structure for capital gains tax, which will explicitly reward long-term investment and is based on a downward taper and lower tax rates. The short-term rate for capital gains tax will remain at 40 pence. But for investors holding non-business assets who invest long-term for 10 years, the rate of capital gains tax will fall from 40 pence to 24 pence in the pound. Yeah. And for those who build businesses or stake their own hard-earned money in them, the long-term rate will be reduced even more from 40 pence to 10 pence in the pound, the lowest rate ever achieved. So, with, with, with a, a 30 pence main rate of corporation tax, a 20 pence rate of small business tax, a 10 pence long-term rate of capital gains tax, 
This government today sends a clear signal of support for enterprise to those who invest in the United Kingdom. My message to business is when you're ready to start out or start up or start investing or start hiring, this government is on your side. Yeah. Now, when half the population have only £200 or less in savings, there is broad agreement we must do more to encourage savings by everyone. There is broad agreement also that an easy to access individual savings account available over the counter in supermarkets and post offices, as well as banks, building societies and financial services providers can encourage the savings habit amongst many more people. I can now report the conclusions from our consultation on the individual savings account. First, the individual savings account will, as promised, offer complete freedom to move cash in and out, and so savers know that cash will always be accessible when they need it. Secondly, in response to suggestions from prospective providers, the cash holding for the first year of the new product will be raised to £3,000. Third, the individual savings account will receive a 10-year guarantee that savings of up to £5,000 a year can be invested with all existing tax reliefs. And fourth, even when new TESAs and contributions to PEPs cease next year, the entirety of capital accumulated in them will be able to continue with all the accumulated gains to enjoy tax relief. There is, there is, there is no the retrospective element. Conservatives Whatever are saying a U-turn. Whatever accumulated capital there is will remain entirely free of tax, so existing PEP holders will be able to keep their accumulated savings free of capital gains tax, and at the same time, they will be able to save an additional tax-free £5,000 each year in the new individual savings account. Now I turn to work. Just as the modern tax system should encourage investment, so too the tax and benefit system should reflect the value we place on the responsibilities and the rewards of work. For far too long in our country, too many men and women have found themselves working harder and longer and have still been unable to lift themselves out of poverty into even modest prosperity. And for too long, we have done too little to help those who work hard to advance up the ladder of opportunity from lower income into middle income jobs and upwards. The cap on aspirations in Britain must now be lifted. While budgets in the 80s acknowledged the need for incentives, the incentives given to the few ignored the even greater problem of disincentives for the many. So it is time to reward the efforts of those who want to work their way up. First then, welfare reform through welfare to work. The New Deal is the most ambitious program of employment opportunities our country has seen. From April the 6th, every young person unemployed for more than six months will have the offer of work or training. From now on, no young person in Britain will be without opportunity. And it's now time to take two further steps that broaden the scope and the ambition of the New Deal. Steps which will open up new opportunities to long-term unemployed adults in our country. From June, every one of the 225,000 men and women who've been unemployed for two years or more can benefit from a £75 a week employer subsidy, which for them will be a passport to work. But the government is determined to do more and we will offer initially to 70,000 men and women an individual service of expert help and advice for them to find work. In this way, we will take another step forward in tackling long-term unemployment in our country. Now, past employment programs have helped men but often ignored employment opportunities for women. From this year, the New Deal will be extended to thousands of women previously denied the chances of work and it will do so in three ways. First, for a quarter of a million women who are partners of unemployed men, we will offer expert and personalized help to find work through pilot programs to be launched in every region of Britain, paid for from the windfall tax. 
Secondly, the Secretary of State for Social Security will announce next week the personal help that will be now available on a national basis for all lone parents who want to work and whose children are at school. And we will implement a 12-week linking rule so that they do not risk losing benefits as a result of a brief period in work. And third, partners of the unemployed under 25 without children who are not allowed to register as unemployed will now be given exactly the same opportunities for training and work that others under 25 now enjoy. So with these proposals, equality of employment opportunity for women in our country is now far closer to becoming a reality. Unemployment blights not individuals' lives alone, but whole communities. So we need a new deal for communities which recognizes that the answer to social exclusion is economic opportunity. And working with the new social exclusion unit, the Deputy Prime Minister and other ministers will announce a series of Pathfinder projects that will put employment at the center of initiatives to improve education, health, and other services in our poorest communities. And there is one group of young people who are the most excluded and the most discouraged. Young people who find themselves homeless. These vulnerable young people do not just need homes, they need jobs. So I want help to be linked to training and preparing them for jobs. And today, to help finance the advice available to the most disadvantaged young people and to create a national network of mentors ready and willing to help advise and motivate young people who could get back to work, 50 million pounds from the Windfall Fund is being allocated. Yeah. And we must do more. Today, while many are unemployed, extensive skill shortages are holding back our economy. So I can also announce extra help in this budget to promote investment in skills and in lifelong learning. Our priority must be to provide training in areas such as computers and the high technology skills, not least to help prepare for the millennium. Over 100 million extra will be allocated in the coming year to tackle these skills gaps in Britain. My right honorable friend, the Secretary of State for Education and Employment, will announce the details of this new skills initiative for our country. Our review of post-16 benefits and maintenance will continue along the lines also that we have already set down. Now, having provided new opportunities for work, it is now time to create a modern tax system that will help create jobs and reward work. So I want to announce today a tax reform to cut the costs of hiring at the wage levels where most new jobs are created. I want to make it easier for companies who are prepared to take on young people looking for a first step on the ladder of employment opportunity and to take on men and women who want to return to work. The Tax and Benefit Task Force, headed by Martin Taylor, Chief Executive of Barclays Bank, will publish its full report this afternoon. And I'm sure that the whole House will join me in thanking him for the work he has done. One of his central recommendations on which he has already consulted employers is for a simpler, fairer, and more employment-friendly national insurance system. One that makes it easier for employers to hire new employees, and one that cuts the costs and red tape associated with the two separate and unaligned systems of income tax and national insurance. His proposal is to radically restructure employment's national insurance, employers' national insurance on a revenue neutral basis, which for business as a whole will involve no additional cost, and to set a rate of employers' national insurance of 12.2%, but only after the first £81 of wages. I have accepted these proposals. From next year, the government will abolish the distorting entry fee for employers' national insurance. We will abolish the multiplicity of separate national insurance rates for employers' national insurance as well. We will therefore cut the cost of hiring lower paid employees. Employees will pay, employers will pay no national insurance on any employee earning less than the starting point of the personal tax allowance, £81 a week. The right to benefit for all employees earning between £64 and £81 a week will be upheld in all the changes we make. But with these changes, we are cutting the cost to business 
of employing 13 million of our lower and middle income employees. We are taking up to 1 million of the lowest paid employees out of employers' tax altogether. And we are cutting the cost of hiring someone on half average earnings by over £250 a year. The Taylor Report also recommends similar changes to national insurance contributions uh, for the self-employed, uh, and this and other matters will be discussed and examined after the Green Paper on Welfare Reform is published by the Minister for Social Security next week. Employers and employees will also benefit from a further institutional reform I propose. The establishment of a single organisation to deal with both income tax and national insurance. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Social Security and I have agreed that the Contributions Agency will be transferred to the Inland Revenue with effect from April 1999. This is a government which does not simply talk about cutting the costs of red tape and bureaucracy, but takes the decisive action necessary to achieve it. Welfare to work is stage one of the reform of the welfare state. This budget today moves us into stage two, ensuring that work pays more than benefits and raising the rewards from work. When it is right for the economy to do so, I will introduce a 10p starting rate of income tax. But I can announce today a tax cut for hundreds of thousands of working families on low incomes, and we will do it through the introduction of a new working families tax credit. Now, under the present system of family credit, there is quite simply a ceiling on aspirations for women and for men wanting to work their way up. In Britain today, there are nearly three quarters of a million working families held back by marginal tax rates in excess of 70%. There are nearly half a million working families with children whose pay is so low that they receive in-work benefits and yet still are required to pay income tax. The Working Families Tax Credit from October 1999 will not only be a tax cut for hundreds of thousands of working men and women with children, but it will abolish the grotesque distortion where some low-paid employees have had to pay back more than a pound for every extra pound they earn. Yeah. So instead of the state paying out benefit through the social security system to working families on lower incomes, in future they will receive cash directly through the tax system. And families will be able to choose to whom the credit is paid, either directly or through the pay packet. By tackling the unemployment trap, and increasing the help available to families, the Working Families Tax Credit ensures that work will always pay more than benefits. And by tackling the poverty trap through cutting the rate at which help is withdrawn as incomes rise, the Working Families Tax Credit ensures that the more you earn, the more you take home. And I say to those who can work, this is our new deal. Your responsibility is to seek work, my guarantee is that if you work, work will pay. And let me spell out in hard cash the difference this guarantee will make. For families and their children, where someone works full time, there will now be a guaranteed income of at least £180 a week. And to the same working family, a second guarantee that no income tax at all will be paid on earnings below £220 a week. Yeah. Now, this government inherited a situation whereby a family with two children paid tax even when they earned only 25%, a quarter of average earnings. Now, under our proposals, they will have no income tax bill until they earn over 50% of average yeah. earnings. It is a transformation in the rewards for work in our country. And because in future work will pay, those with an offer of work can have no excuse for staying at home on benefits. I said in the last budget that in the New Britain, everyone had a contribution to make. Now with these new guarantees for working families, we can also say in the New Britain, for millions more people, we will make work pay. There is one further tax and benefit integration I want to announce. 
For decades, thousands of disabled people have been denied a basic right, the right to work. And the tax and benefit system is one of the barriers that has denied them opportunity. As a government, we will never compel to work disabled men and women who cannot work. And for those who want to work, we will systematically remove the obstacles that at present prevent them from achieving their potential. So alongside the Working Families Tax Credit, the government will introduce a new tax credit for disabled people in work, paid through the wage packet, and a new 12-month linking rule to improve the incentives for those on long-term benefits to take a job. Together, these measures will ensure higher rewards for disabled men and women if they choose to enter work, making work pay. And today also, I want to make one further change which sends a signal to every employee in the country about the importance this government attaches to fair rewards from work and to work. For men and women on lower incomes, middle incomes, upper incomes, right up the income scale. We said at the election we would not raise the basic or top rate of tax. And we will keep this promise, not just for one year, but for the Parliament. But I am abolishing the perverse entry fee every employee pays to be part of the national insurance system. And in doing so today, I am cutting national insurance tax for every employee in the country. Further reforms will also ensure that no one pays national insurance for the first £81 of their weekly earnings. All employees earning between 64 and 81 will have their rights to benefits protected. So from next April, 20 million employees in Britain will benefit by paying £1.28 a week or £66 a year less in national insurance. This is not just a tax cut for lower income Britain. It is a tax cut for middle and upper in Britain as well. It is a tax cut for everyone in work. Our reforms, therefore, signal the biggest change in national insurance. Our reforms, our reforms, the merging of the contributions agency and the inland revenue, the radical restructuring of national insurance employers' contribution, and the changes I have announced in national insurance are the biggest change in the structure of national insurance for a generation. And I have one further change that will make thousands of men and women better off, and in particular make a difference to family incomes. For too many parents, the cost of childcare has meant either that parents cannot afford to work or find themselves paying out most of the wages on the cost of childcare. So we will introduce a new childcare tax credit as part of the Working Families Tax Credit. And we will put high quality childcare within the reach of people who have never been able to afford it. For spending on childcare of up to £100 a week for the first child and 150 for two or more ch children, the tax credit will cover up to as much as 70% of the cost. And the rules that we draw up, which will be reviewed after two years of experience, will be designed to ensure that parents have access to high quality childcare in childminders, day nurseries and out of school clubs. And this is a change that today makes a reality of choice for hard-working families previously denied it. Childcare from now on will be affordable for the many and not just the few. Yeah. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, families are the bedrock. Families are the bedrock of a stable and healthy society. And in a fast-changing economy, with its uncertainties and vulnerabilities, families now more than ever need the security of support when bringing up children. Family values means we value families, all families. So our economic policy must not only encourage a stable and healthy society based on mutual rights and responsibilities, but directly support families as they bring up children. And this is not just for the four million children growing up in poverty in Britain today, but for every child who should have the best opportunities. But the system of child and indeed family support that this government has inherited is confused in its aims and contradictory in its impact, and it must now be reformed on the basis of clear objectives. 
The starting point in 1998 is exactly the same as stated by the Beveridge Report in 1944, that nothing should be done to remove from parents the responsibility of maintaining their children and that it is in the national interest to help parents to discharge that responsibility properly. We implement these objectives, of course, in a changed economy, where parents now are trying to strike the right balance between paid work and family responsibilities. And in this new context, I believe that we must do more to encourage family-friendly employment that will help children and their parents. That is why, as part of the social chapter, we will legislate to guarantee unpaid parental leave. And I'm pleased to confirm that the CBI, as well as others, are in support of this endeavor. Yeah. Giving children the best start in life requires also good schools, good health service, good childcare, good public services, as well as cash help. As a country, we invest around 10 billion a year in a wide range of services for young children. And for the first time, a broad-based review of how we can integrate the whole range of services involved in the support and care of young children and their families is being carried out, and proposals will be announced with our spending review in the summer. Giving a child the best start in life takes more than money, but it cannot be done without money. And I believe that child benefit remains the fairest, the most efficient, and the most cost-effective way of recognizing the extra costs and responsibilities borne by all parents. And raising it allows us to do more for mothers who choose to be at home, working at home, bringing up children. To underline the view that ch child benefit is society's support for and investment in the upbringing of children, child benefit should remain and will remain universal where it is already universal. And it should be paid as now directly to the mother. So future support for children will be built around universal child benefit, and I am convinced of the case for raising its level. After careful examination, there are three complementary changes I believe we should make. First, we all know circumstances dictate that some families will need more help than others, and that the case for additional support for children in the poorer families is strong. But that support should be on the basis of identifiable needs of children, not on whether there happens to be one parent rather than two. There is, in my view, no case for a one-parent benefit. We will not return to that. Yeah. Additional support should be provided not on the basis of family structure, but on the basis of family need. Yeah. Second, our benefit system provides less help for children when families need it most in the early years. Low-income families on benefit in or out of work receive eight pounds a week less for a child under 11 than a child over 11. And this distinction does not reflect some of the high costs of the early years, takes no account of the cost to mothers of staying at home when the children are young, or of the extra cost of childcare if mothers are working. So it is time to do more for children under 11. And to achieve our goals, we must look more broadly at the current approach to children and families in the tax system. The state pays a tax allowance to married couples, but the state pays exactly the same amount at exactly the same rate to unmarried couples with children, whether or not they have ever been married. The state pays exactly the same amount at the same rate as married couples allowance to single parents. And indeed, the state actually pays the same amount for up to a year to couples who separate or divorce and does so whether they have children or not. Such is the confusion of the current system that if a married couple with children split up, both man and women can each receive the equivalent of a full married couple's allowance for up to a year. So separated, they can actually receive up to twice the allowance of a married couple. The only way to make sense of this chaotic system is to make our primary aim that of supporting families through supporting children. Yeah. That is why from next year, we propose to raise child benefit by reducing these allowances, now paid at 15% to 10%. The change will not affect any elderly taxpayer whose extra allowances will be fully protected. I have therefore decided that from next April, for the first child, child benefit will be raised by more than 20%. 
a £2.50 a week rise in child benefit, in addition to the normal uprating for inflation. £130 per year rise, the biggest increase we have seen in child benefit. Yeah. And these changes will be fully reflected in the family premium for income support. It is the right thing to do to support and strengthen families in our country. And from November this year, for those on family credit and income support, child support for the under 11s will be raised by an additional £2.50 a week, so that the needs of Britain's youngest and poorest children are properly recognised. Yeah. With these measures, we can give every child a better start. And I believe that in future years, we can and we should do even more. And for those who want to see child benefit raised in future, the question undoubtedly arises as to whether it should be taxed for those at the top of the income scale. It must be right in principle that if child benefit is raised in future, then there is a case for higher rate taxpayers paying tax on it. Modernisation of the welfare state to make possible more investment in the children of our country. And following the Children's Review, we will bring forward detailed recommendations for reform. I have one further announcement. For hundreds of thousands of men and women, care within the family extends beyond caring for children to caring for disabled or elderly relatives. So valuing families means valuing carers, spouses, grandparents, all the carers who contribute to the family. And as a first step to recognising the importance of carers within the family, this government can I can today announce I am ending an injustice that the previous government tolerated. The tax allowance, which has been available only to men with children whose wives are incapacitated, will now be extended to mothers with dependent children and incapacitated husbands. And because of the importance I attach to ending this unfairness, I will backdate this additional help to April 1997. Yeah. I, now turn, I, now turn, I now turn to the environment. The Kyoto Summit, the Kyoto Summit was a landmark for international agreements on the environment. And the work of my right honourable friend, the Deputy Prime Minister, in securing agreement has been widely applauded. Having signed up to an 8% reduction in European Union carbon emissions, we are determined to play our part nationally and internationally in meeting these targets. And in these important policy decisions, which affect generations ahead, there will be proper information, proper consultation and full openness in government. I can confirm first that VAT on the installation of energy saving materials funded under certain government grant schemes will be cut from 17.5% to 5%. Helping yeah. This will help to insulate 40,000 more homes per year. And we are now pursuing with our European partners a wider relief. There has been increasing pressure, not least from businesses themselves, for measures that encourage greater energy efficiency in industry. I am therefore grateful to Sir Colin Marshall, the Chairman of British Airways, and until July, President of the CBI, for agreeing to head a government review into economic instruments to improve the industrial and commercial use of energy. This will include a study of whether or not new economic interests, instruments, such as an industrial energy tax, and or other market mechanisms should be introduced to help curb industrial emissions, and if so, how this will be done. Concern for the environment is, of course, not limited to the uses of energy. Last year, we commissioned work on the environmental costs of the quarrying of aggregates and on options for dealing with water pollution, and detailed results will be published in the near future by the Environment Minister but we already know that we need to do more to reduce the amount of waste going to landfill. So I will raise the standard rate on active waste from £7 to £10 per tonne 
from 1st April next year. Consistent with our environmental objectives, from October next year, I'm exempting from landfill tax the inert waste used in the restoration of sites. Road transport is the fastest growing source of carbon emission. So we do need a more balanced transport policy. The government therefore proposes to make two major environmental-led changes to long-term transport policy today. First, the quality and quantity of public transport must be improved. So I am pleased to announce that over the coming three years, as a result of this budget, a total of over £500 million in additional money will be invested in public transport. And my right honourable friend, the Deputy Prime Minister, will announce details later this week. But today I can announce a £50 million a year rural transport fund. Three quarters, three quarters of rural parishes and communities have no bus service. Our aim, our aim must be to extend the range of transport services throughout the country. So this fund will invite applications from rural communities who want to improve their local transport services. And as an added incentive, I will increase the rebate on fuel paid to bus operators yeah. to help keep bus fares down. Yeah. Now, the government recognises that for many people, especially in isolated areas, car ownership is not a choice, but a necessity. And so now I want to rebalance car taxation so that it falls less on car ownership. And I want to make the change in an environmentally sensitive way. From January next year, I am cutting the license fee for lorries and buses with clean engines by up to £500. But I also want to make a major reform of the license fee for cars. From next year, I plan to reduce the license fee for cars with the lowest emissions. For the cleanest and the smallest cars, I plan to cut the license fee by 50 pounds. And as we make the preparation for this long-term environmental change, for this year, I propose at a cost of 145 million pounds to freeze the license fee for all vehicles, to encourage lower emissions, and this is what we will do. The costs of converting company cars to road fuel gases will from now on be disregarded for income tax purposes. At the same time, I'm increasing the scale charges for fuel provided by an employer, which will cost the typical car com company car user around £1 a week. The duty on road fuel gases will be frozen, increasing the incentive to use these cleaner fuels as well. Now, the last government introduced a road fuel escalator, the principle of which we supported. They set it at 5%. Since July, it has been 6%. There is agreement that only with the use of an escalator can emission levels be reduced by 2010 towards our environmental commitments. As a result of the escalator, road fuel tax will rise by 4.4 pence a litre for unleaded petrol and for ultra-low sulphur diesel as is normal, this change taking effect on budget day at 6 p.m. And to encourage all diesel users to switch to cleaner fuels, ordinary diesel will increase by one pence above that. These increases will reduce carbon emissions by 1.7 million tonnes of carbon. Yeah. Now, of course, the price of petrol will also be affected by movements in oil prices. The oil price has fallen by 25% in the last six months, a benefit enjoyed by all companies that is yet to be passed on to consumers, especially consumers in rural areas who already pay higher fuel prices, something the Office of Fair Trading is already investigating. Whatever the short-term changes in oil prices, the government, however, has a duty to take a long-term and a consistent view 
on the environment, environmental impact of emissions, and this is what we have done. We are today publishing in the Red Book an environmental assessment of our proposals. Now to other tax measures. I said that we will maintain the basic and top rates of tax for this Parliament. As is usual, we will increase all income tax allowances, income limits and tax thresholds in line with inflation. I turn now to this year's budget decision on mortgage tax relief. I can tell the House that I have decided in this budget to make no further change in the rate <laughs> or, or to make any change to stamp duty on property below a quarter of a million pounds. For property sales above a quarter of a million pounds, stamp duty will be raised to 2% from next Tuesday and to 3% on property sales above half a million pounds. A change which leaves 98% of house transactions unaffected. I have a... I have... I have a decision to make also on inheritance tax. Many have put to me the case this year for freezing or even cutting the threshold. I've decided to do neither of these things. This year I will raise the threshold for inheritance tax by £8,000. Under this government there will be no inheritance tax to pay on estates below £223,000. 97% of estates will not have to pay inheritance tax. Rules on inheritance tax concerning chattels will, however, be tightened up to ensure proper access. I want indeed to improve access to our nation's museums and galleries, and I have yeah. therefore decided that extra money will be made available to help museums and galleries which do not currently charge for admission to maintain free admissions in the coming year. As promised in, previous budget, in, the, in the last budget, I will raise revenue over the next three years by closing a number of loopholes left by the last government, including offshore trusts, <laughs> raising... Conservatives pointing at the Paymaster General Geoffrey Robinson. There's been speculation about his offshore trust. Raising, raising in all the measures we take from dealing with these things in loopholes a total of £1.5 billion pounds over three years. Next month we will be publishing and consulting on draft legislation for a general anti-avoidance rule for direct taxes. From January the 1st next year, alcohol duties will be uprated in the normal way, one pence on a pint of beer, four pence on a bottle of wine. For a bottle of spirits, the duty will be frozen at its current level and I shall be taking action to clamp down on smuggling and fraud. To on tobacco, in line with the commitment, on tobacco, in line with the commitment I announced last year, the excise duty will rise by 5% above inflation. From 1st December, the tax on a packet of 20 cigarettes will rise by just over 20 pence. Details of these duty changes together with details of changes to certain gambling duties, are published this afternoon. I have had many budget representations, including many widely publicised campaigns, pressing for new tax reliefs. I have decided that there is a case for one new tax relief, for giving. I want British citizens to be able to contribute more to poverty relief and to education through charitable work in the developing countries. For every £100 a British citizen donates, the government, under the proposals I will announce later today, will contribute up to £40. Yes. I want the millennium to be remembered, not just nationally, but internationally, for the redemption of debt and the reduction of world poverty. And this new tax relief will allow individuals to make their contribution to the reduction of world poverty. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I said that this would be a budget based on prudence for a purpose, and that guides us also in our approach to public spending. When we came into government, we said that while we undertook a strategic review of future spending priorities, 
we would work within a two-year ceiling on departmental spending. The comprehensive spending review, the results of which we will announce this summer, will shape our public spending priorities into the next millennium. But as a result of the work of my right honourable friend, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, and as a result also of departmental willingness to root out waste and this year reallocate resources to our priorities, we have already achieved more than some expected. £400 million to help pensioners with fuel bills, £1.5 billion already to patient care in the health service, £3 billion to employment opportunity, more than £2 billion to education. Because of our disciplined approach this year, we are able to carry over extra money from this year to next. I've already said that public transport will receive an additional £500 million for the next three years. Ours is prudence for a purpose, to meet the people's priorities. We are determined to improve education all round, so I'm allocating for the coming year to education an additional £250 million. Yeah. That, makes, that makes a total additional commitment to education since we came to power above what the previous government proposed of two and a half billion pounds. Yeah. And I can also tell the House that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health, and his colleagues in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will be making announcements this week. The extra money I announced last July for the National Health Service comes on stream in the Health Service from next month. And I have decided that this additional allocation to health of $1.2 billion for the coming year should today be increased by a further 40% another £500 million pounds to £1.7 billion. Pounds. This takes the total additional investment that this government has provided for the National Health Service in our first 10 months to £2 billion. Pounds. The National Health Service is safe in this government's hands. Be because we will always be prudent, I am allocating £500 million to add to the reserve in 1998-1999. And it is therefore because of our prudence that we are able to meet our manifesto commitments, to reduce the deficit and to invest more in transport, education and the national health services. The ambitions of the British people are once again the ambitions of the British government. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a budget that, by its measures, advances both enterprise and fairness. We have cut corporation tax, we have cut small business corporation tax, we have cut national insurance for every employee in the country, and we have raised child benefit for every family. This is a new Labour budget that has set new ambitions for Britain, so that for millions, ambitions can become achievements and I commend it to the House. And so the Chancellor sits down, pretty much one hour, two minutes. I didn't actually get the seconds for those of you who take bets on how long he speaks. Order papers waving on the government side on the left of your picture there. And after a brief announcement, William Hague, leader of the Conservatives, will get on his feet and give a first reaction. And while we wait for that, let's just have a look at some of the key measures that were there in this budget. Tax and benefits. Working families are going to have tax credit replacing family credit in, from October 1999. Uh, make work pay was one of the things he said over and over again during this budget statement. And childcare costs for low-income families are going to be allowed as a tax credit. They didn't say the level at which this was going to take effect, but to allow people to go out to work and leave their families in safer childcare and better childcare than they can at present. And then uh, tax and benefits on married couples allowance, that's going to be cut to 10% from 15% in April 1999. It's a way of switching money, he said, from whether people are married or living together or whatever, to the children, and therefore child benefit as a consequence would go up by £2.50 a week above the level of inflation from April 1999. He's not going to tax child benefit at the moment, but it is, he said, a subject to review because some people thought higher paid 
uh, people should be paying tax on child benefit, but that's for the future. On motoring, there were big changes. First of all, the price of the tax disc for smallest, sm the smallest cars, that's the ones that give the least emission, is going to be cut from 150 to 100 pounds. And he's going to freeze other tax discs for this coming year, so no increase for bigger cars. Unleaded petrol goes up by 4.4 pence a litre, and leaded petrol up by 4.9 pence a litre. And then finally, the duties that were announced, just briefly, not many surprises there, cigarettes up 20 a pack, beer goes up a pound a pint, wine goes up four pence a bottle, those don't take effect till next January, and no change in the duty on spirits. Let's go back to the House of Commons now and pick up with William Hague, leader of the Conservatives. The measures, announced, the measures which he has announced on corporation tax, on small companies' tax rates, on the challenge fund or universities, the reduction in national insurance contributions, and indeed his reform of capital gains tax, which is almost exactly on the lines proposed by the Shadow Chancellor, the Right Honourable Member for Hitchin and Harpender. Except, except that it is not quite as ambitious as the reform proposed by my Right Honourable Friend. So in his talk of new ambition, he may be getting a bit ahead of himself We've always associated the Chancellor, and indeed the Prime Minister has always associated him, with old ambition yeah. rather than new <laughs> ambition. And I think that has been on display uh, again today. Uh, we will also look at the details of some of his proposals before deciding whether we support them or oppose them. Uh, we will look at the details of what he has proposed on stamp duty. It will be a great relief to the Prime Minister that he sold his house before the Chancellor yeah. introduced the measure which will only affect rich people with houses over a certain value. But any analysis must start from where the government themselves started, when they inherited last year an economy in the finest shape of any economy, <laughs> inherited, inherited by any government after any election since the Second World War. And of course they started with their pre-election promises, their now notorious pre-election promises which must be seen against the background of this budget and their last budget taken together. Because the Prime Minister said before the election, we've no plans to increase tax at all. And he's told Radio 4 listeners last January, the programme of the Labour Party does not imply any tax increases at all. And he told BBC One viewers four days later, there are no hidden tax rises. And two months after they took office, the Labour Party tore up those solemn promises. They introduced 17 new taxes or tax rises in their very first budget. So that now, under this Labour government, Mr Deputy Speaker, after the taxes and mortgage rises that have taken place over the last 10 months, the typical family is £798 worse off in a year. Nothing the Chancellor has done today remotely compensates for the price people have already paid over the last 10 months for a Labour government. The overall tax burden in this country is set to rise by almost three pence in the pound even before this budget. And we will look very carefully at today's figures to see what the new rise in the tax burden will be. So there has been, in the course of these two budgets, a betrayal of businesses by the Labour Party that made a that made a great play, made a great play of being a friend of businesses and has already in the last year slapped £22 billion of extra taxes onto businesses. Nothing the Chancellor has announced today remotely makes up for the tax increases that he announced before. And a betrayal of rural areas for all his cosmetic gimmicks, for all his cosmetic gimmicks today, by a Labour Party that posed as the friend of the countryside and has today added to the costs of people in rural areas with an additional tax hike on petrol. Yeah. And a betrayal of many women and children by a Labour Party that promised to protect universal benefits and is now becoming the first government ever to tax child benefit. Yeah. So there is a betrayal and a great deal of disappointment for many people who will have heard this budget today. Now, this government were lucky when they started. They inherited the fastest growth of any major European economy. They inherited unemployment falling fast, the lion's share of investment from outside the European Union, 
inflation under control, and as this morning's borrowing figures have shown, the public finances even stronger than our last budget forecast. We hit our inflation target right on the button in the last government. The governments have now missed their inflation target in nine months out of ten, including in the latest figures published today. It was the Chancellor's duty to preserve a golden economic legacy. And step by step, step by step, he is betraying that legacy because his record is already telling a tale of two economies, services booming and manufacturing on the brink of recession. Manufacturing output, manufacturing output has fallen for five successive months. If these figures turn into a manufacturing recession, it will be a recession made in Downing Street. Because for industry, for industry, he has created the worst of all worlds, higher tax and higher interest rates, and with higher interest rates leading to an ever higher pound, export orders and jobs are at risk. The Chancellor has so little confidence in his own policies that he has even downgraded his own growth forecast for this year in the fine print of the budget today. Last November, he was predicting between two and a quarter and two and three quarter percent growth. Now he's predicting two to two and a half percent growth. And that is a change in just a few months. The Red Book, published a few minutes ago, says that manufacturing output will be flat this year. It says in a wonderful euphemism that net trade will make a negative contribution to the growth of the economy <laughs> this year. What does, it mean? what does it mean in Treasury speak? Net trade will make a negative growth to the, con to the growth, negative contribution to the growth of the economy. It means businesses are being crucified by the exchange rate. That is what it means. Net trade will make a negative contribution. And there was plenty the government could have done in this budget to help industry out of those difficulties. They could have cut the cost of creating jobs in other ways. And the Chancellor has made, some, has made some changes on that. But he could also have abandoned the idea of a national minimum wage. He could have, he could have freed up capital markets further. But over the last year, he has hit on the worst solution, an all-out assault on pensions and savings, the £5 billion a year pensions tax in last year's budget, introduced by stopping pension funds from claiming tax credits on their dividends. And then there was the plan, of course, to abolish PEPs and TESSAs and replace them with the individual saving accounts. I am glad we have forced the government into a humiliating U-turn over their plans for ISAs. We may have lost the vote in this House, but we clearly won the debate. But don't let the Chancellor think that he hasn't done damage to savings in this country. Savers now know what the government really wants to do. They know that the Labour Party have an instinct for retrospective taxes on savings. The government has done permanent damage to Britain's savings culture. And in the forecast published alongside the budget, again published a few minutes ago, the Chancellor forecasts a sharp fall in the personal savings ratio. That's what, that is what happens when you clobber pensions and savings. He forecasts that it will fall from 11% to 9%. How is he going to build a high investment, high productivity economy while at the same time pursuing policies and putting out forecasts which show a sharp fall in the personal savings ratio? And in any case, the government have made only a small step towards getting their policy right. Dropping the retrospective limit is the right thing to do. But there is no case for keeping a lifetime limit for any savers when there is an annual limit uh, as well. Any lifetime limit increase the cost of the scheme, making it less attractive to savers. We will await the details of the Chancellor's proposals in due course. But no government can seriously claim to be building up the economy for the long term when they slap a £5 billion a year tax on pension funds as even the government's actuary has told them, if you take a tax hike out of pensions, people will have to pay more. Yeah. The chairman of the Association of Consulting Actuaries, speaking at a dinner last week, said that these ramifications of the Chancellor's proposals last year were clearly not thought through at the time of the mini-budget, and frankly, they should have been. He said, we all know how much damage has been done because our words went unheeded. They must stop loosening the foundations on which our robust system of occupational pension schemes has been built. The Chancellor has done nothing to repair the damage of those measures uh, today. 
He has proposed the Working Families Tax Credit System to replace the family credit system uh, which we currently have in this country. Now, the Prime Minister told his party conference that he vowed to reduce spending on welfare. He made it the top priority of his government, the test by which he wanted to be judged. And on this side of the House, we have always made clear that, that we support reform of the welfare state. But it's now clear that they came to power with a heap of promises, a bundle of aspirations, a lorry load of cliches, but nothing resembling a plan. And the Chancellor has produced today a plan which is a reform that increases expenditure, which increases the number of people tangled up in the benefit system, that increases complexity, and the central reason for that mess is the scrapping of family credit and its replacement with the working families tax credit. In order to re redeem a pledge to reform welfare, the Chancellor has devised an extremely complex system, which I think he hopes none of the commentators will understand. But when they see it, they will find that it has put women at a disadvantage. The Chancellor says people will be able to choose to whom the benefit is paid. What happens if they don't agree? Who is going to arbitrate? Yeah. Are ministers going to decide which member of the family receives the benefit? Is the Chancellor going to decide personally who is going to receive the benefit? When people have seen the details, they will see that the scheme is a burden on business that demands that businesses keep records of family circumstances. They will see that if he changes the tapers and withdraws benefit more gently from some people, the government will be spreading means testing higher up the earnings scale. They will see that this will produce higher marginal rates of taxation and benefit withdrawal for people on middle incomes. They will see that his scheme will extend the problem of benefit withdrawal up the income scale from one earner families to two earner couples, and as a result, it will hit women on modest earnings who are particularly sensitive to such disincentives. We don't object to the government running its own neck into the noose, but we object when it's taking millions of poor working families with it. And the Deputy Prime Minister says no. Those are the words of the current President of the Board of Trade the last time this scheme was floated by our government in 1986. She was, she was objecting to the scheme in 1986. And the difference is that we withdrew it when the problems became clear. The Chancellor has now pressed on with it, hoping that the more problems and chaos he causes, the more radical his reforms will seem to be. There has been a report about a very similar system that now prevails in Canada. It's a report by a Mr. Mendelssohn. Yeah. I, hope, uh, I hope no member of the government is moonlighting, by the way. But Mr. Mendelssohn says in his report on the Canadian scheme that if in Canada the working income supplement, that's a comparable scheme, has proven a false start, there is reason to suspect that the British experience, should it attempt to establish a UK earned income tax credit, may turn out to be more like Canada's than that of the United States. Yeah. So we suspect that the Chancellor yeah. is making a great mistake. Yep. Changing from family credit to tax credit in itself doesn't alter family income by a penny. But this policy looks, at first sight, from what he has said today, as if it will cost the taxpayer a great deal more, as if it will be a disincentive to work for thousands of people, and that it will mean that hundreds of thousands of women will see more than £50 a week taken from their purse and placed in their partner's wallet. Yeah. Producing that, introducing that reform, makes an incomplete job of welfare reform at considerable cost to the taxpayer. It means he has done a botched DIY job on welfare reform at a price the Lord Chancellor's decorators would have been proud of. Yeah. Now, the, now, the Chancellor's spin doctors the Chancellor's spin doctors like to claim that they came into office with a carefully worked out programme for government. So how embarrassing it must be to once again postpone the 10p income tax rate. Never has a policy been more frequently announced than the 10p income tax rate to which the Chancellor says he has committed. He announced it before the election, he announced it during the election, he announced it after the election, he's again announced it again now, still nobody is actually going to enjoy a 10p tax rate. When is he going to actually implement the 10p tax rate to which he is committed? Because let him be in no doubt, if he wants to cut taxes, we will support him. We will certainly join him in the lobby 
to vote for lower taxes, but let him now produce the 10p tax rate to which he has been committed. We are pleased to see that the Chancellor accepts the need to reform national insurance contributions and we will support smoothing them out and reducing the burdens on employing lower paid people. However, instead of reducing burdens, the Chancellor has uh, decided to redistribute them. Before the budget, even those employing workers paid more than £210 were only paying 10%. Now even those paid £81 a week will carry a marginal employer's national insurance tax of 12.2% instead of 10%. As a result by this reform, although he didn't refer to this in his speech, he's actually increased the burden of employing a large number of quite low paid people. If the Chancellor was going to make such reforms, he should have done it by cutting tax, not by shifting tax onto somebody else. And if the Chancellor admits that reducing the cost of low-paid staff is a vital job-creating measure, then why on earth does he support a minimum wage? Exactly the same arguments that he proudly deploys today in favour of his reform are arguments that devastate his own case on this issue. The Chancellor has also introduced measures concerning childcare, and much of that is welcomed on this side of the House. It is why, for instance, we introduced childcare disregard into family credit during the last Parliament. It is not clear that what he has announced today is anything more than switching our policy on family credit uh, into his new tax credit system. But and by itself, today's measure helps only lone parents and two earner couples who use registered child minders uh, and clubs. What about those who stay at home and look after their own children? A proper childcare package would be aimed at the very least at them equally. It is a crazy situation that it looks on uh, first analysis that after today's budget, two neighbours may be better off looking after each other's children yep. than looking after their own. Yeah. That is not a policy with which we will agree. We will want to see a policy which supports people who look after their own children as well as who look after the children of other people. Much of what he said on that, however, we mention at least he was self-sacrificing and did not introduce a special tax relief for looking after children for the duration of a photo call, uh, and we are very pleased uh, to see that. On child benefit, the decision to tax child benefit for upper-rate taxpayers poses more questions than it answers. Why leave untaxed the wife of a millionaire who doesn't work while taxing the head teacher who does? Uh, why take away a cash benefit and spend it on unspecified government programmes when the real aim is to reduce the size of the welfare state. The Chancellor has some time because of his review, uh, yet another review, to find the answers to those questions. We will judge him and his reforms of child benefit uh, by his answers uh, over the course uh, of the next year. But the government has now got itself into a hole on welfare reform. And after messing about with a bucket and spade for a few months, the Chancellor has come along today with a huge mechanical digger. But the reforms that he has proposed are intended to make work pay, will for many people make hard workers pay. Welfare bills that they vowed would go down are instead going to go up. And the dependency that they pledged to reduce will instead increase. He has announced some spending increases, and we welcome the use of money not spent elsewhere to be spent on education and health. But what is remarkable about the increases in the health budget announced today is not that the government are putting more resources into the health service, but that it would have been a national scandal if they had not. They came, they came to office, they came to office with a pledge to reduce waiting lists. Yet step by step, month by month, they have betrayed that promise. Waiting lists, waiting lists have risen relentlessly, up by almost 100,000 in the 10 months they have been in office. And far from being more generous to the health service as they promised, over the last year they have dramatically cut back the rate of increase in spending on our health service. Under Conservative governments over 18 years, the average increase in health spending was 3.1% in real terms. This year, under a Labour government, it has risen by 1.2%. Well, as William Hay goes into an attack on the spending policies announced in the budget, and uh, that goes on for some time, there's a debate, of course, on the budget itself, let's have a look at the very thing he was talking about, the complexity of the arrangements that the Chancellor announced. You saw 
uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown shaking their heads uh, in disagreement when he said that the effect of all this was that working people, uh, not the very poor, but working people would be worse off as a result of the measures. Peter Snow, of course, has been working out exactly how the families we saw at the beginning will be affected. And let's see what his answer is. Peter, well, do you now have all, all the facts and figures there? I hope so, David. Or, or, or some of them. This was a budget absolutely <laughs> packed with changes, packed with fascinating reforms. Uh, and it is all essentially focused uh, on pushing people from welfare into work with the emphasis on childcare and this new tax credit. Let's just take a look now around Budget Town and see what he's done. First of all, then, look at the prices of petrol uh, as of tonight. Leaded petrol up four pounds, uh, four, uh, 4 .9 pence a litre, unleaded up a little bit less, 4.4 4 .4 pence, diesel up and 50 pound cut in the tax disc for smaller cars. The first time now we have graduated tax disc, it's cheaper if you have a smaller car. 500 million pounds more for public transport over three years, 50 million pounds a year for rural transport fund to promote transport uh, in the countryside. Again, this is how he's getting the money to push resources into helping people who need childcare and so on. Look at the prices of tobacco as from tonight. Cigarettes up 20p a packet from December 1998. Sorry, not from, uh, not from tonight, from the end of the year, 1998, December. Uh, look at what's happening to drink. The off-license, this went up in January. Now here we are, it's going up. Alcohol, beer up a penny a pint from January next year. Wine up fourpence a bottle from January 1999. That's a year after us put uh, wine and beer up this last January. Social Security, here we are, here are the changes now on Social Security, and here is the central focus of this budget, a working family tax credit from October 1999, payable, and this is the point about it, payable through tax rather than through the benefit system. The Chancellor clearly indicated he's going to put much more money into that tax credit as the years go on. That is a bonus that people in low paid work get, they get cash tax credit, it'll be in the pay packet rather than through the benefit system. So the new working family tax credit, further to that, then he's going on to look here at the Tiny Tar Tiny Tots Nursery Centre in Budget Town. Child benefit is up by £2.50 a week for the first child. There'll be a tax credit for child care of up to £105 a week. That means that you'll actually for the first time be getting cash, effectively cash, for child care if you want to go to work. It does, of course, only apply to those who are going to go and work, the child care that's affected there. Now along to our uh, factory to see another major change on national insurance. The employee's threshold is raised to £81. It's always been much less than the income tax threshold. It's now up to just actually just above the income tax threshold. That'll be worth £66 a year to every worker, and employers' contributions will be reduced for the low paid. Major change on national insurance. Capital taxation, corporation tax down uh, for big and small businesses. On now to look at the uh, inland revenue. Here is the changes on income tax. Not very big. He's not going to tell us yet what he's going to do with that 10 pence starting rate of tax. He said last year he would do it when it was prudent. He's now saying it's going to be right for the economy. So we're not, we're not knowing, we're not going to be told yet when he's going to reach that 10 pence starting rate. Married couples allowance, though, is cut from 15 to 10 percent. So on the whole, people are going to do a little worse as far as income tax is concerned, but thresholds are up with inflation, so uh, they do gain a little bit from higher allowances. It's the job centre, and now we're going to see what happens to uh, the extension of welfare to work. Uh, it will be extended to women, not to men, but to women over 25. Of course, up to now, 1825, get that uh, uh, extra help. Now it will be for women over 25, uh, for women over 25 only. Here we have the changes now on the uh, savings bank. The individual savings accounts, which were criticised for putting, he was criticised for putting a ceiling of £50,000 on those savings accounts last year. He now says there'll be no limit on transfers. The shouts of a U-turn from the Tories when he said there'll be no limit now uh, on switches from Peps and Tessas. And now, of course, this budget is also uh, about spending as well as about taxation. Uh, here we have the changes in education, £250 million more for schools. Uh, and the chemist will proudly display a little green disc here tomorrow morning telling us that it will be £500 million more for the NHS. So there it is, a very big reforming budget with a large number of tax changes. The whole focus of it, though, is pushing these resources, largely taken from extra indirect taxation, into more childcare, into this new working families tax credit. Peter, thanks very much. And we'll hear about your individual families a bit later on and how, that, what, how they've reacted to it all. Um, Peter Jay is here. We saw his film earlier on about the state of the economy, the difficulty manufacturing industry was in. And we heard the Chancellor say there that one of the jobs of the Chancellor was to be the guardian of the people's money. 
which is what a lot of chancellors have failed to be in the past. Now, how do you think he has done in terms of the economy as a whole? And well, where's he getting this money from that he's saying he's going to give away to people? The big practical question, I think, especially for people who are worried about the strong pound and worried about interest rates, who are, which is most of the people in business who are worried about the short term, uh, is whether what he's done is going to be enough to persuade the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, the hawks who were, you remember they were split 4-4 when they met in February, the governor of the bank gave a casting vote, 4 thought interest rates should go up, 4 thought not. Whether he's done enough to persuade the hawks to become doves. Now in theory, as Bridget rightly pointed out, the budget is supposed to be about the medium term and the Bank of England is the one that worries about the short term. But one of the problems of the last 10 months has been that the markets have believed and that some people at the Bank of England seem to have believed that the government's budget position wasn't as sound and, uh, as it should be. The Chancellor much resented this and felt that he'd done enough last July. The question now is, uh, will they think that he has? And the figure which is really important is the improvements in the uh, government's accounts. It is clear now that the budget deficit for the year ending, the PSBR, has come down from 12 billion forecast last November to only 5.1 now um, forecast for the outturn. The forecast of the public sector borrowing requirement for next year has come down from 6 billion, which in, in the pre-budget report in November to 1.6 billion. That is a very striking improvement in the uh, government's accounts, mainly because tax has been coming in much faster than uh, the Chancellor and anybody else thought in the forecasts uh, before. And as the Chancellor said in his speech, he's locked that in. He's not, as it were, given that away again, which he might have done. However, the members of the Banks Committee will also turn over a couple of pages in this great tome, the Red Book, in which all information is provided and look at what is called the cyclically adjusted budget deficit. That's the one that allows for the fact that the economy is moving from recession to boom or from a degree of boom to a greater degree of boom. And there you discover that the improve, there is still an improvement in the government's accounts, but not as dramatic as, as it appeared. That the uh, general government's financial deficit, as it's called, which is the best measure of the government's deficit, has come down from 0.7% of the GDP, which is what people thought in November, to 0.5%, an improvement of about um, 200 uh, million pounds. And that just might or just might not be enough to persuade the hawks so, in, uh, on the Bank of England so Committee. So you're, unde that you're undecided about no what they'll further do. Need. Well, yeah. I, I'm not undecided. The question is what they decide. Yeah, but uh, you're it, undecided about how they'll jump. Well, it, it is said that every... Uh, uh, £250 million is worth a quarter percent in interest rates. The change that is made cyclically adjusted is just about that amount. So it just might be a difference of a quarter percent. If that persuades everybody in the Bank of England's committee to say, right, no more interest rate rises, that would bring the pound down quite sharply because the expectation that there will be more is what holds it up. If that came down, then the impact on exporters and others would, over the next 18 months, be quite substantial. OK. Bridget Rosal, what do you think? I think that uh, there's a risk that uh, what's in this is actually a lot of sound and fury which doesn't signify very much at all and that the things that have really happened as far as the overall picture for the economy are concerned are all things which aren't happening today, they happened a year ago. We've seen, as Peter just pointed out, this very sharp tightening in public sector borrowing for the year that we've just, we're just finishing and what we've got for next year is something which is actually very little different from that a little bit further down, but really nothing very much. And if you look at the, sort of all these big changes which we're uh, being presented with and uh, which we're probably a bit confused by, add up to taking it away here and giving it back somewhere else. Now those things are, can be very important, certainly that structural reform of the tax system, which is, is what I said at the beginning I thought that the Chancellor would do. But in terms of the overall environment, it doesn't actually add up to very much. So. Whatever positions people took previous to this budget on the economy, and whether it was overheating, underheating, was slowing down, wasn't slowing down, I doubt that this budget will change their mind. So do you give the Chancellor a clean bill of health on the point that he made about looking after the people's money? Well, I think that it's a very easy thing to say, isn't it? I mean, it does take an awful lot of it away from us, and all Chancellors do. They take nearly, nearly half of, uh, of everything that we bring in, in the sense that uh, he's... Uh, <coughs> he's certainly not wasting it on profligate schemes, then I would say, yes, he probably is looking after the people's money, as well as any Chancellor could be expected to do. OK. And, and Mr Darling, Chief Secretary of the Treasury, you, do you think that, the, uh, that actually what's going on here is what the Liberal Democrats are always saying, of Liberal Democrats sitting beside you, which is that they're building up, you're building up cash in reserve for, to put it crudely, election bribes in a couple of years' time? 
No, we're running the economy in a prudent way. We inherited a situation where we had huge debts. Some of the Tories had doubled the national debt in the last uh, six years. And uh, we inherited a situation where they were going to spend over £20 billion more than they were getting in. Now, as Gordon Brown told the Commons a short while ago, we've reduced that. Uh, we're getting the borrowing down. We're uh, creating a stable platform on which we can build in the future. Now, if you want public services that are going to grow in a steady way and the sort of public services and schools and hospitals we all want to see, uh, what you must avoid doing is doing what the Tories did in the late 1980s, where they misread the signals uh, and a surplus turned out into a £50 billion deficit in the space of two years with high interest rates and so on. Now, what we're determined to do is to have a stable economy. We want uh, low inflation uh, because that is the best platform on which we can provide services, as well as, of course, providing the best sort of background for business. And we've done a lot today uh, to stimulate investment and to help businesses. OK. Let's have a look at uh, one or two of the specifics in this. Personal finance, for a start, and some of the measures that were announced by the Chancellor. And then we'll talk about those in, in more detail and how they'll affect you. No limit on transfers from PEPs and TESAs to ISAs. Remember, this was the great contentious point. People who already had more than £50,000 saved, would they be allowed to put them all into the new uh, in, uh, independent savings account? The answer is they can, individual ones. Um, and the tax relief has been guaranteed for 10 years, so it's fairly safe for a bit. And a £3,000 limit for cash investment in the very first year of ISAs. And then, um, in addition to that, uh, no limit on the transfers. We've had that. We've got another page of stuff coming, I think. Yes, national insurance. Um, at, the, at present, £62 is the point at which you start paying, and you have an entry fee in national insurance. Now there are going to be no national insurance contributions either side, employer or employee, on the first £81 of earnings from next April, that is. The inheritance tax threshold, some people thought there might be uh, increases in inheritance tax, changes. Well, as far as we know, they're nothing unless it's in the small print. And the threshold has been increased uh, in line with inflation. And uh, possibly future uh, transition of child benefit for higher earners, taxation rather, of, of child benefit for higher earners. We get, don't know who's going to be done by that. It, the manifesto Labour said this was to be a universal benefit. But if it's a universal benefit that's taxed, rather hard to see how it remains a universal benefit. But anyway, that's what they're planning to do. Now, Moira, what do you, what do you pick out of that? How are people actually going to be affected? Yeah. The ISAs is um, the, the, the big change. Quite a climb down from um, the, the previous document. Um, first of all, in year one, you can invest up to £7,000 so that you can put in your 3000 um, you don't have to transfer your PEPs in at all. Um, you can keep them in their existing form, um, which again was one of the big criticisms. People were concerned that they had a variety of providers and they were being forced to transfer perhaps into one provider only and therefore they, would, they wouldn't be making a very sensible investment decision to put all their eggs in one basket. That's changed. Um, in addition to that, um, the, uh, the, the, the rules on um, having only one provider in in each year have gone. You can now have a choice of having one provider that can provide all the different aspects of the ISA or you can go to different providers for the different elements, a cash ISA provider, an equity ISA provider, a life assurance provider. So again there's much much more choice. I think that's all to be welcomed. Um, no prize draw unfortunately so those that were looking forward to that um, will be disappointed. Um, capital gains tax I would have to say is, is quite a disappointment. Um, what have you been hoping for? I have to say, I was hoping for some real radical reform that actually made it much, much simpler. It's the most complex tax for anyone to get to grips with. But he did say he was going to have a longer term capital gains tax rate, yes, different from a short term. He has. Um, the way it's been introduced is fairly complex, to say the least. Um, there's a, a long scale taper. The old rules aren't changing. The new rules are just taking effect from April 98. So if you've had assets for some years, you've got the old rules to contend with up to April 98, and then the new rules as from April 98. So that's, that's all quite messy and, and possibly open to abuse. Um, I think some people will be looking to take advantage um, of the, the special um, 10p rate for businesses and, and indeed the, 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 the reduced rate for other long-term assets. What about things that might have happened and didn't? Because they're always quite interesting too. Inheritance yes. tax, not much yes. change on that. Stamp duty only on very big yeah. houses. Inheritance tax, very wide speculation that um, potentially exempt transfers, the gifts made during a lifetime uh, would cease to be beneficial in the way that they currently are, but there doesn't seem to be anything hidden away on those at all. Um, and the other fear of a reduced uh, nil rate uh, band, which was set at 215,000, 
fear that that would go down, it's actually gone up by a small amount. Um, so a lot of people uh, will, be, will be very pleased and relieved about that. Anything else particular you want to draw attention um, to? Something else tucked away on capital gains tax. Right. Yeah, it's the end of bed and breakfasting as from today. So hopefully um, those people who did want to take advantage of their capital gains exemption this year did their uh, homework before today. Right. OK, let's have a look now, uh, Andrew Dillnock, with you at the, at the effect of all this on families. Let me just run through what was in the budget statement. Um, working families tax credit, this is the big change, of course, to replace family credits from October 99 up to £105 a week tax credit for childcare, that's 70% of the cost of childcare for low-income families, I think undefined, but Andrew will tell us whether it is in the small print, child benefit to go up by £2.50 a week above the inflation rate from April 99, so an increase in child benefit. Now, um, Andrew, there's been a lot of talk about this working families tax credit. Is what he's done what you've expected and how powerful an impact is it likely to have I think it is very much what we'd expected. It's going to come in even later than we thought. It's, it's going to come in in some ways in 18 months' time. In fact, it's not going to be paid through the pay packet for two years, not until April 2000. So it's a long way off. He's spending quite Why a lot of... Why is it taking so long to do it? I think he's, it's taking a long time because you've got to line up the shift of a whole load of employees from the DSS to the Inland Revenue where they'll, where they'll need to be retrained. And then we have to have systems in place such that employers can pay the, pay the money effectively. The worst thing that could happen for the government would be for this thing to start and fail, which is what happened to its predecessor family credit when it was introduced in 1988. But he is spending quite a lot of extra money, about one and a half billion pounds. Most of that is going to go to people who are going to be brought into entitlement to it. It's going to go further up the income scale than family credit did. It's cutting the total tax and social security withdrawal rate to a bit less than 70 percent, 68.5 percent for a lot of families, but it's increasing to 68.5 percent the tax rate that a lot of families will pay. Whether this will have a really enormous impact on the number of people choosing to take work, I think to assert that would be to take a pretty hopeful view of it. Mm. Okay, what else? Well, the decision to cut the value of the married couples allowance was not, I think, entirely expected. So we're going to see the value of the married couples allowance cut from 15% to 10%, and that money used to increase child benefit. Now, that's a long-standing Labour Party aim. What that's doing is redistributing money from people who don't have children to people who do have children and increasing child benefit, which the government is keen on, while at the same time you know, toying with the idea of taxing it in the future. What's the position of uh, the lone parents, single mothers, that there was such a row about? Uh, what was done for them well, the, the, and for unmarried couples? The removal of, of extra benefits for lone parents for new claimants after April is being continued with. That's being gone on with. But there are increases in other elements of the social security system that, that will affect all low-income families, whether single, family, single parent families or two parent families that will more than offset those. So the government can simultaneously say that it's going ahead with its decision to treat single parents and two adult families the same while not actually making single parents worse off. So this notion of uh, work, make work pay, which is what the Chancellor said over and over again, uh, has he achieved that? Will that be the effect? Well, I think an important measure that he has taken that, that will help is the reforms to national insurance contributions, which are taking further reforms that Nigel Lawson introduced in 85 and 89. These are important changes. About the only distortion we can identify in the labour market is the national insurance system. There are people bunched just below the national insurance floor at the moment. I think that Whose wages help. are being kept down because they don't want to pay national insurance. Well, so not, and not just they don't want to pay it, but their employers don't want to either. And so yes. by removing the, the jump in national insurance liability, I think things will be helped. Okay, even though employers, of course, are paying more, well, higher up from, goes up from 10 to 12.2. But anyway, we'll, come, we'll deal with that later on, perhaps, when we're talking to some businessmen. Let's go um, down to Swansea and join Diana Medill. Diana. Thanks, David. So, how do our mothers here in Swansea view Labour's proposals in the budgets to support families? Well, now, Wendy Reid, you want to work, you want to go out into the workplace. Do you think that you're going to be helped by the proposal here? Well, if they uh, take money and put it back into the wages and into jobs, yes, I, I do think it would help me to get a job and others to find jobs. You're know? optimistic. Yeah. Well, but Elizabeth, you want to stay at home. You've got four children under the age of 11. Do you think that choice is protected in this budget? Not at all, no. Um, what the Chancellor has given to us in the rise in child benefit, he's taken away from us in the married tax allowance. And it's, the fact still remains that my husband is being taxed at the same rate as if he was a single man, and yet he has five dependents. And to be perfectly honest, there's no help for me unless I choose to go out to work. 
and there's no recognition that the work I am doing in the home is valid work. And yet Labour talks about supporting families. Yes, it's all noise, all words, just like the last government. Helen Hitchens, you're a single parent. Now, what do you think about what the government has proposed? Do you think it's going to help mothers in Swansea? Well, I don't know about mothers in Swansea, but I know that um, I think that the principle of taxing, sorry, the principle of... Um, I'm sorry, you have to pass It's okay. <laughs> Don't worry. Well, I, I think, I think that basically the jobs they shouldn't cut loan Say, for cream. example, let's, mm. let's look at the job situation in Swansea. Do you think the jobs are there if people want to go out and work and help Well, a lot of jobs way? in Swansea are very low paid. Mm. So even if a woman had childcare and even if she had money to pay for it, the kind of work she'd get would not make much difference compared to being on the dole, for example. And a lot of it's night work, a lot of it's very tough work. There's also a lot of care that goes on in Swansea, I think, through family networks, which is not recognised by this budget at all. I mean, if you're not a registered childminder, but you're still looking after your grandchildren or whatever, this doesn't make any allowance for that. So a good bad and I think from budget. cutting the loan parent benefit in Swansea would have quite serious repercussions. I think that's quite negative for children as well as for parents. So good, bad or indifferent? Um, I'm indifferent. You have to be very careful about the quality of childcare, Marie Gillespie. You mm -hmm. were concerned about childcare provision earlier in mm -hmm. the programme. Are you convinced that's going to be protected? Well, I think um, there's been a lot of talk about reducing the cost of childcare, and that's good. But it doesn't actually say or mean very much for the quality of childcare or the, the range of provision of childcare. I mean, the kind of thing I would like to have seen is, the, is uh, for example, tax incentives to employers, that would sort of open up opportunities um, for more workplace childcare, crashes, crashes sort of and thing. so forth. And also, for example, resources to schools to enable schools mm -hmm. to set up preschool and after school cl clubs. And you know, as we've seen here, I mean, just because uh, somebody is uh, working in the home, it doesn't mean to say that, for example, um, working uh, mothers working in the home don't need drop in centres and childcare facilities that help them. Um, to do their work as well. Okay, let's so. move on. We've got Kevin Fitzpatrick with us now. Let's find out about, about disabled people. What about the tax credit system that's being introduced here? Yes, I think you're right, Anna. I think this is an encouraging budget for disabled people. The Chancellor's done three crucial things. He's introduced the, the tax credit, as you said, for disabled people in work. Um, he's also released or eased the burden on the benefit linking rules to 12 months, which will give people a, a greater safety net and, rem and um, ease the benefit trap for disabled people who are seeking work. And he's also um, introduced an equity for disabled um, people who are caring for disabled people. So optimism there? Yes, I think so. Okay, well, let's move on to John Morris, who's an employer. 300 people in his oil company. What about the measures that Gordon Brown was proposing, which was to help people back into work? Help. Well, the, 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 the NHI at um, <clears throat> 80 pound a week has to have some benefit. Unfortunately, I suspect the, the level is very low and that it won't impact on too many people. Um, the detail needs to be worked through, but um, the words sounded excellent, the details didn't quite stand up to the same sort of scrutiny. So, all in all, good, bad or indifferent? I, I'll wait and, and, and read the details, but uh, on the surface, uh, the words all sounded right. But it's the detail, it's the fine print. So, David, back to you. Thanks very much. Well, Alistair Darling was listening with interest to what was being said down in Swansea. The point people were making about childcare was that childcare is very expensive and that what you were doing wasn't enough to pay for their childcare. Well, we're making a major contribution to childcare because as part of the Working Families Tax Credit, uh, people will get help uh, up to 70% uh, of uh, childcare costs, up to uh, the top rate of £100 or £150 if there's more than one child. Now, that help isn't there at the present time. What we've been doing, the whole, the whole thrust of uh, the reform this afternoon, has been to ensure that work uh, pays and also to ensure that women and men going to work who would otherwise be prevented from doing so because there's no childcare will get help towards doing that. And I think that when people look at the detail of the Working Families Tax Credit, uh, which is now available, they will see there's help available 
uh, where it's never been available in the past. And I think that is a major reform that will be welcomed by all those when they see it. So do you think this is a first step and that uh, next budget and the budget after things go well, you'll make it more generous? Is this a sort of start of an ongoing policy well, on this? The things? Chancellor made it clear this afternoon that uh, the, he, we've set up this new system. Of course, we'll keep it under review. But I think the, the, what, what the major change is that people actually get help through the tax system. You know, someone, for example, uh, earning £100 a week now uh, can be guaranteed £180 in terms of take-home pay. People will not be paying tax uh, under uh, £220 a week. So who's going to so, pay for all this? Well, the, the, the Working Families t uh, Tax Credit uh, is financed, as you, you see, set out from the various means uh, that have been announced uh, this afternoon. Uh, and we, we believe that it is a, you know, an extremely worthwhile and useful means of, uh, of getting incentives, getting people to go into work where they, before, they've always said, well, the job doesn't pay or I can't get childcare. Now those barriers have actually been removed uh, because of the fact that the Working Families Tax Credit will be in place. The other thing is, of course, it's much, much more efficient than the benefit system. Okay. A lot of people just simply didn't claim the benefits or alternatively found that if they earned an extra pound, they actually paid more than a pound uh, but in terms of loss of benefits and tax, and that absurdity has now been removed. Well, Kenneth Clark, the previous Chancellor of the Exchequer, has just joined us. You thought of doing this, didn't you, and then decided against. Well, when we you, did. We, we hear the way it's been spelt out. Do, do you agree with what Alistair Darling says about it? That's a good step. Well, we did it by a different method. We did it by family credit, and we did it by a childcare disregard. Which uh, he says is discredited. It didn't work. Well, uh, he's just not invented here, that's all. We had a look at this American system. We found it was overcomplicated. It lent itself to abuse. And if we had the danger it would transfer money from, uh, from mothers to fathers. And they've actually made it more complicated by saying couples are going to have to choose uh, whether they want to benefit the mother so or a, a tax credit. Yes, yeah, so they consult their accountant, no doubt, Alistair, and read your red book in order to decide whether it's advantageous for them. <laughs> they, I, they, well, well, we're all in favour of uh, helping childcare for the low paid. The budget speech I've just heard was so full of generalities. I've only just worked out that it doesn't go all the way up the earnings scale. But it, uh, child care allowances uh, will apparently get a tax credit if you're low paid. Uh, I need to study just, I assume it is more generous than the one they took over. Uh, the difference between what the previous one cost and what this one will cost will show how much they've improved it. They've gone in the same direction as us, but I don't know by how much, and I don't know how they propose to pay for okay. it, because that wasn't shared with the House of Commons. We'll come back to uh, more details of this budget uh, with you, if I may, in a moment. But let's now look at the measures announced for business. The principal ones, corporation tax ceiling of 30% for the rest of this parliament. It might be lower, but it was not going to go above 30% for large companies. Small companies' rate to be cut to 20% from next April, and capital gains tax cut to 10 pence for long-term investment. And uh, in addition to that, employers would only pay national insurance contributions on earnings over £81 a week instead of 62 and a new single rate for employers of national insurance contributions of 12.2%. So the question is how that grabs people in Edinburgh and Mackenzie. Thanks, David. Well, indeed, uh, here in Edinburgh's Financial Centre, we've been uh, chewing over the effects of the speech on the markets and on business. Bill McCall, first of all, uh, the Chancellor used his favourite word, prudent, a lot throughout that speech. Is that how the markets saw it? I think it would, must be a red letter day for a Chancellor of a Labour government to see the, the FTSE 100 rising to a near record close this evening. Uh, the city looked at his PSBR numbers and then the detail within that red book and certainly the equity market and gilt market have, have moved ahead. Unfortunately, though, the pound has also moved, and I think the debate will now move to uh, the early part of next month when the Bank of England will decide whether rates will move or not. And it goes back to that Doves v Hawks discussion we had some time ago, and John uh, was picking up in the studio in London just a while ago as to whether Mr Brown has now proved that he is prudent of fact enough and, uh, to see interest rates perhaps being lowered or is it still going to be an interest rate rise on the card? So I think uh, much remains to be seen, but a new record high in London this evening must be pleased with that, I would have thought. Well, Nicola Horlick, as a fund manager, you expressed your concerns before the speech about uh, the ISA concept. He's fiddled with it a bit. Is it enough for you? Are you now convinced that this is a good budget for, for investors and savers? Well, it's certainly good news that what people have in PEPs is now there forever. And people have the opportunity now to put £5,000 a year over a 10-year period into ISAs as well. So 
So it does encourage savings. And it is very important that we should encourage savings because, after all, we do have a problem across the Western world with people getting older, having to provide for their retirement, and the state cannot afford to support people or keep them to the standard of living that they're used to. So it is a very important principle, I think, for governments to encourage saving. And certainly, I think the ISA is a reasonable concept. It possibly could have been a bit more generous. But I think as long as people get into the habit of saving early and saving regularly, then it will mean that there's less of a burden in the future on the state. Right. How do the, the CBI see it? It was described by the Chancellor as a budget for enterprise, uh, a budget for business. Was it? I think uh, all too often the devil lies in the detail and it will be necessary to see behind the Chancellor's words. However, overall I think business will welcome what he has said today. The drop in corporation tax, the drop in corporation tax particularly for small companies uh, must be welcomed. As far as transportation is concerned, I think we need to look at the detail there and I remain worried about the effect of the increase in petrol prices for rural Scotland. And national insurance, how does that play with you? Because it is going to hit employers. We welcome the simplification. I think my concern lies there uh, that uh, higher paid employees and the companies that employ them may have to foot a larger bill and anything in any of these which leads to higher costs within companies to administer them is a concern for us. Uh, and lastly, obviously, I welcome the freeze that has come on to excise duty for spirits. I am concerned that we didn't hear any question of a major review which would involve brewers uh, as well for the future of this important industry. Right. Tracy White, um, it seems not perhaps a particularly redistributive budget. Is that the way the unions would see it? I think um, there's certain elements that are redistributive in the package, but I, I, mean, I, I share the concern about having to see the detail of, of what's on offer. The, the, um, the movement on child benefit we would want to particularly welcome. We have slight concerns about the changes to the, the national insurance contributions for employers. Um, the, the, the possibility of employers being encouraged to keep pay below £81 a week is something that, that makes, uh, makes us slightly worried. We would, again, we'd need to look at, at the detail there. On the work and family tax credit announcements, um, again, the implementation will be really important. It's, 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 it's vital um, that, that that's introduced in a sensitive way. Right, Bill McCall, briefly and, and finally, what are the implications, do you think, for the movement of the pound, which both unions and the CBI have been talking about in terms of jobs? I think the unfortunate thing is that the Chancellor gave that uh, chalice, whether it be poisoned or not, to the, the Bank of England. And as I say, the game moves on there next month and they will have to decide the future of, of British exports. But, but he obviously hasn't done enough to convince them that interest rates uh, should be either held down or brought down. It remains a very fine line and I suspect with a 4-4 split last time, Mr George will be exercising his uh, chairman's waiver next time round as well. Anne. What's your betting then? Would you say interest rates up again or can it be I, I, would, I would say we've pretty much got to the end of the cycle, although the gilt market uh, this evening, just as uh, we came in here, suggests that there may be one final quarter point to come. Whether that will come this month or not remains to be seen, but I think we're edging close to the final rise. Right, Bill McCall, thank you. Gentlemen and ladies, thank you. With that, back to you, David, in London. Thanks very much, Anne. Well, now, uh, Kenneth Clark, you heard him say in Scotland, business welcomes this budget. I didn't quite hear it that way. I heard them say they weren't quite sure what effect it would have on high-tech companies who will pay more national insurance contributions for their high-paid employees. Uh, the corporation tax you presented as no doubt the Treasury dished it up to you as it did to the House of Commons as a reduction in the corporation tax rate. The changes they've made to payment of corporation tax I think still bring a few billion pounds Gordon Brown's way during the lifetime of this Parliament. I think they've reduced the 22 billion pounds they plan to load on business, but I don't think they've loaded it much. But I, I repeat what I said before, one does have to look at the detail, I know we've all said that, but I cannot remember a Chancellor getting up, making more grandiloquent words about reforming the tax system for a generation, and then sitting down without telling us anything about how much he was spending on this or how much that was costing. Uh, just for one example, he talked about raising from loopholes 1.5 billion pounds. No explanation of what tax change that was. My past experience of Gordon Brown is what he calls a loophole a Scottish businessman would call a tax relief on his business. So I share the view of your canny Scots out there. I think we're going to have to read the documents here because the speech we just got was a mere public relations occasion. Uh, not informing the House of Commons. Okay, well, uh, 1. 1. 1.5 billion would just about meet family tax credit increase over, over the present system. 
well, working you, family credit. Well, you have this figure. If, if that wasn't true. given in the chamber. Well, we've been working it out. I don't know whether Andrew agrees with that. Do you, do you know about 1.4 well, billion? The, the, the 1.5 billion is per year where, uh, of extra money on working families tax credit, where yeah. the 1.5 billion of tax avoidance, I think Alistair Darling will confirm, is over a number of years. It's a cumulative total. So no, but the tax avoidance... Ten years to get Even it. if the tax avoidance came in, it wouldn't fully pay for the, the annual cost of the working families okay. tax credit. What do you say uh, uh, to the point about uh, the inflation effect of the increase in national insurance? No, I, th I think that... Which is uh, going to be more expensive. I think this, this is something we consulted on. Uh, we got Martin Taylor from Barclays Bank to uh, do a lot of the work, and he talked to businesses, and what businesses wanted was to get rid of the complexity of the national insurance system. Particularly, you'll find typically, you know, companies will employ people at the lower end of the wage scale as well as people at the higher end. And what they wanted to do was to get rid of a situation which we have at the present time where you've got four different rates, and it's now been rolled into one rate. Now, overall, for business, uh, the thing is revenue neutral. But I think that the main thrust of this budget today has been to create a situation where it is easier to employ people, the cost of employing people has been reduced, something the business has always wanted, and it's for the good of the economy, as well as socially of course, uh, to get as many people who can and want to work into the workforce and off benefit. Now this is a real you know, reform of uh, the tax and benefit system, it's the most major reform for the last uh, 20 years or so, and I believe that when people sit down and look at it, they will realise the benefits of having a, a simpler system, one that makes work pay, makes it worthwhile to go out and get a job, give help with childcare, and at the same time, from business point of view, it's actually good for enterprise. Not just that, but of course the other measures as well, corporation tax, capital gains tax reform, which you know I took from the audience in Edinburgh, uh, they seem to be far more in favour of it than they were against it. Do you buy this, uh, this description? Of national uh, insurance? No, the, of the budget that we've just heard. Well, it certainly is. That, I mean, the budget is clearly trying to take, uh, take people and encourage them to work. But I think it would be disingenuous to say that that's an entirely new thing. There are a number of things that the last government did very much along those lines. And one of the things they did, which was greeted with most delight by all sides of the House and outside, and certainly greeted by us at the IFS, was the introduction of a childcare disregard in family credit, uh, which was a very good idea, was quite generous, and so far has been taken up by about 36,000 people. So I think the hope of this budget that through schemes will really transform the economy may turn out to be an ambitious one. Bridget? How do you say what Alistair Darling said, and indeed Kenneth Clark, you have them both transforming at your, at your the economy, disposal. Transforming the economy and uh, changing the tax system for a generation is of course an incredibly ambitious thing and not something that's going to be achieved in one budget. On the other hand, it's not clear to me what actually has been achieved in this budget and I do agree with Ken that uh, the amount of detail that we were actually given in the speech, you know, we're now all ploughing through this uh, pile of paper trying to work out where the money is coming from to pay for different bits and parts of schemes and it's, it is actually very difficult to tell at the moment. I think that uh, it is certainly the case that it is not obvious that the reduction in corporation tax rates is as generous as it looks at first sight because the change in the way of uh, how you have to pay your corporation tax uh, and paying it as it were in advance on future profits or estimated profits, still not clear how all of that is going to pan out. That does mean in fact that businesses could as easily be worse off than better off on the corporation tax side. National insurance is a bit different. I agree that the simplification is, uh, is a good thing. And, what if the um, slight increase in the rate doesn't matter? The slight increase in the rate, I think, will clearly be a burden on people who pay above average earnings to most of their will staff. Will it be inflationary? It will be certainly a benefit to, however, the people who do employ mo many low-paid retailers, for example, who have been creating lots of jobs, and for them, it will be a very considerable <laughs> benefit not to have this entry price ticket. In other words, you hit that limit and suddenly you pay national insurance on the whole lot. But will it be inflationary? Will people put so up their prices I'm, to meet the, meet I the know, cost? I don't know, no, because it, uh, it, no. I don't think it will be inflationary because it's right. precisely at that end of the market that you will be better off, both as an employer and as an employee, through not having to sort okay. of, as it were, hit that sudden buffer and therefore be limited at that end. So from that point of view, I think that in particular is actually very welcome change. Okay. We've been joined here by Ed Davey of the Liberal Democrats Treasury team. Now, what did you make of the budget? Well, there's some really good points, actually. I unambiguously welcome the reforms to national insurance, employees and employers' national insurance reforms. The integration of the contributions agency with the inland revenue is a very important organisational change, which I think will reduce bureaucracy on business. So, I mean, it, we'd be churlish not to welcome that. We've been calling it for it for a long time. 
But I think when you do look in some of the details and the economic assumptions that the Chancellor's basis budget on, there are some, some real um, problems in there. For example, they've increased their forecast for the GDP deflator for next year. That means public expenditure is going to be cut in real terms again at next year. And although he announced a certain small increases in cash terms for education and health, they'll be more or less wiped away by the higher inflation. And so the waiting list that we've seen that hit record levels uh, uh, this year, the increases in class size we've seen, that's going to continue. And I think the government's making a very severe political miscalculation if it thinks that later on in this parliament it's been able to turn that around. So this uh, extra 500 million uh, for the NHS, 250 million for education, <coughs> Not enough, in your view? Nowhere near enough. Um, no. The schools are crying out for, for extra investment, and by sticking to the Tory party's uh, spending uh, limits, uh, Ken Clark's, which I think yeah. you, 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 you said they were it's for the bullets. It is indeed, it's that's exactly now. right. They're actually it's worse than the Conservative. Yeah, they're spending uh, a lot less. They're increasing spending on the health service and education that's exactly by right. a much slower rate than the previous government. That's right. Yeah. In fact, we've put in. Uh, over two billion pounds into each of uh, health and education which wouldn't have been there but for the change of government but I repeat the point you know for the Liberals benefit and that is that I'm not going to repeat the mistakes that we saw in the late 1980s where over optimistic signals were misread and we went from a surplus to a 50 billion pound deficit okay. in the space of a couple of years and, and, and I think it is far better I think to have a situation where uh, public services grow in a sustainable way and we are putting additional money in real terms increases into both health and education that would never have been there but no, for the change no, of government. Well, okay, all right, just before you, I know you've got to go in a moment, yeah. just before you do, uh, one line from this budget, it must be right in principle that if child benefit is raised in future then there's a case for higher rate taxpayers paying tax on it. That's what the Chancellor said. Your manifesto, we're committed to retain universal child benefit where it is universal today. Well, How do we reconcile well, the those Chancellor two said things? exactly the same uh, thing this afternoon. Child benefit will remain universal where it is universal. But what he's saying is that if you want to really increase child benefit in the way that we uh, did today, the extra two pounds fifty, for example, oh, that might be well, taxed. Well, no. You, 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 if you really want to do something more than just an inflation increase, to actually divert help in a meaningful sort of way to the care of children and uh, assistance in child care costs, then it becomes a nonsense. Uh, you know, if people like you and me get uh, more and more money, and uh, you know, we're just less. So with it's it. still a universal so benefit, even though it's taxed it's away once it's, it's given. It's it. universal because you know anyone uh, with children get it. Uh, but uh, you know, clearly, uh, if we want to make sure that those who need it most. And I think the whole concept of need in terms of benefit is something that has been much overlooked in the past and something the Chancellor was addressing this afternoon, then it makes sense to look and see whether we should tax it. Now, we haven't reached a concluded view on that matter. It's something that we want to look at. But really, people do have to think, if you want to really uh, give additional help in a way that counts to individuals, then I think you do have to look at the whole question of better off people actually making a greater contribution. So, uh, so it's it likely to be taxed, and uh, the notion of universal, um, where it's universal, it will remain universal, it needs a dictionary no, a redefinition, no, it, it really, it, to make, it, it make any it's sense it's at all. There's, there's a killer problem it. they haven't solved. You get it. It's taken away again. No, it's, not all, it's, not, it's not all taken away. Of course it's not. If somebody gets child benefit, in the same way as if you get income, uh, you know, and then then uh, y you receive it. Now, what we're saying is that the higher rate, we, we ought to look at whether or not it should uh, that we should uh, tax the system. I'm going to make the point at the moment: the poorer people at the moment on benefit who actually get child benefit lose it until the chancellor took action this afternoon to stop that happening. Now, I think you know if you want to help people on low incomes, especially bearing yeah. in mind that one child in three is now being brought up in You're poverty, then we've honestly. got to. No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> You're I'm, playing for time. I'm making, I'm making a very, very important <laughs> okay. point. We're determined to help yeah, children fine. who need help. Okay, fine. Um, and you run out of time on that point. Thank no, you very much indeed. Uh, hold on. Let's just go and, and look at something else now. Just a reminder of what was in this budget. And then uh, we'll go to Peter Snow and see how it affects individual families, the key thing that um, Bridget was talking about, how people are really affected. The measures anyway included a working families tax credit, which we've been talking about, to replace uh, the current family credit in October 1999, and childcare tax credit for low-income families up to 150 for more than one child, £100 limit for one child. That's uh, one of the first main measures. Tax and benefits... The married couples allowance is going to be cut to 10% from 15% April 99, 
The child benefit's going to go up £2.50 a week above inflation from April 1999. And of course, as we were talking a moment ago, discussion about whether that should be taxed for higher earners. And then some um, surprising changes on motoring. The car tax disc, that's the annual vehicle excise duty, cut to £100 from 150 for small cars, so a 50% reduction for smaller cars, less emission and all the rest of it. Un, uh, um, the other ones are frozen. Unleaded petrol goes up 4.4 pence a litre, leaded petrol up 4.9 pence a litre, all that from 6 o'clock tonight in the traditional way. And on duties, cigarettes up 20 pence a pack, that takes effect in December, and the drink duties take effect next January, beer up a penny, wine up four pence a bottle, and the duty on spirits is frozen. So those are the main measures as they'll <coughs> affect families. And uh, let's hear from Peter Snow exactly how those families are affected when it's all totted up and how they've reacted to it, more importantly. David, we've asked um, seven families, a wide range of incomes, to join us uh, in our newly designed budget town. And what we're going to do is show those families what the changes between now and the end of the coming tax year, in other words, between now and the end of March 1999, over the next year and a bit, what those changes will do to those families' incomes in direct and indirect tax terms. It won't, for example, include child benefit. It won't include anything that new tax credit may do way there, away in October 1999. So for the coming year, then, here are the changes for these families. Let's start off at the bottom of the scale with someone who's unemployed, and she lives in Bristol. There she is. It's Bev Strange. Hello, Bev, in Bristol. Hello. Uh, Bev, I'm going to bring up now a little checklist here of how this budget affects you over the coming year. You're an unemployed loan parent. Uh, your direct tax changes, effectively, your income support is going to go up £2.50. There is this increase in income support and family credit of £2.50 right away. Indirect tax makes you four, by four pence a week uh, less well off. You don't drink and smoke very much. And so you're better off by £2.46 a week as a result of the changes in this budget. But very broadly, Bev, what did you think of the Chancellor? Um, well, I didn't really think much of it. I think he, you know, he's trying to help out, but it's not gone far enough. I really do think that childcare, maybe the emphasis shouldn't be on us. It should be the emphasis on employers to do that childcare. Then you don't have the squabble between who gets it, the male or female partner. There, there, was, there was quite, quite a lot, lot there, there in childcare, wasn't there? Of course, it doesn't apply for, you know, nearly two years away, or more than two years away, some of the childcare credit and so on in family, in you working family tax credit. But um, that is going to be quite valuable if, of course, you go back to work. It only applies if you want to go back to work. Does any of this make you think it may make it easier for you to go back to work? It may make it easier. The family credit at the moment doesn't go far enough with helping out with the mortgage. So if the new tax credit does help out with the mortgage, then yes, I would jump at the chance of going back to work. Right. Now, what about the um, whole thrust of the budget on indirect taxation and so on? It doesn't affect you very much, as we see, just four pence worse off each week. But cigarettes up, petrol up and all that kind of stuff, you expect that to be part of the, all part of the fund, do you? And that's going to go and finance uh, help for the lower paid. Is that, is that a sensible, broad strategy for the Chancellor? Um, well, like you said, it doesn't really affect me, so it, it doesn't bother me. I would, in fact, I would like to see perhaps it go up a bit more so that, you know, we'd get more tax back on it so that it might help the lower paid even more. All right, All right. well, thank you very much for that. Let's move on to someone else uh, who's uh, unemployed uh, next door, or next door in Budget Town. Actually, uh, they're quite a long way away from uh, Bev. Uh, they are actually sitting in their drawing room in Edinburgh, Michael and Karen Keogh. Now, Michael, what did you think of what the Chancellor said about this whole business of putting people, pushing people back into work? Let me just, before I come to you, Michael, let me just push up here on the right-hand side your new balance Thanks. sheet for the weekly changes and direct and indirect tax. No change in direct taxation for you. Um, indirect tax, 84 pence worse off. Uh, now, that's because you, um, you, do, uh, you do indulge in the odd weakness, don't you? Um, and you're worse off by 84 pence a week because of uh, prices in the shops going up a bit. But broadly, what do you think of what the Chancellor did? Well, I, thought, I t honestly thought that the Chancellor it was an average budget. Now, the question that I was most interested in is about this training for work. It says six months and there's 70,000 people long-term unemployed. Where are all these jobs coming from? You know what I mean? Now, me being a job seeker, I'm asking where exactly are these jobs coming from? 
You hear me, Peter? Yes, I do, uh, Michael. I mean, he's held the whole thrust of this budget was not creating jobs by more public spending, which you might have, I think you said you were in favour of that before, but the idea of trying to persuade people, give people the incentive to return to work by giving them more mm -hmm. incentive that they feel that they'll gain more from working rather than being unemployed. Yes, I'd, 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 I would, I'd rather be working than drawing the benefits, but like to say, I mean, I'm not just the only one. There's a lot of people out there you know what I mean? I've tried, I've tried, I've tried to try and get a job. But on, I mean, we could try for a thousand jobs a week and we mightn't hear from anyone. OK, Michael, I'm going to move on. Thank you for that. That was very helpful. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, now we'll move on now up the street to the house next door, uh, which contains, surprise, surprise, people from yet another side of the country, Preston. Uh, up in the northwest, George and Marie Hyam, uh, and you, George and Marie, are on six thousand pounds a year. Uh, direct tax changes, seven pounds seventy-four richer. You get two pounds uh, fifty more on those for those family credits. You have no fewer than five children together. Indirect tax, forty-six pence worse off uh, because of the drinking and so on and the uh, everything else you run in the way of stuff that uh, attracts indirect taxation. You're better off by seven pounds twenty-eight a week, George. How about that? Marvellous, considering we'd be better off. Uh, what do you think, Marie? Thirty-five thousand. Marie, now you're the yeah, yeah. you're the one who works in this family. You actually draw family credit at the moment. You will be eligible for the fa working family tax credit that comes in. How's all that going to change things for you? She must well, again. for looking at it from face value, it looks as though I'm going to be better off. But you've calculated I'm going to be seven pound odd better off a week. That doesn't make up for the deficit that we've got at the moment with me working. We'd still be better off on benefit. Be Obviously, we'll have to wait and see how it's implemented, but that's the way it looks to me at the moment. It's still major questions that haven't been answered yet. I mean, will employers cut pay? Because they know that it'll be topped up. They'll know exactly by how much it's going to be topped up. Um, will the passport benefits remain? Will I still get free prescriptions? Will I still get free eye care? Will I still get free dentistry? If not, I'm worse off again. Uh, Marie, how about the childcare provisions? The idea that when you get uh, this new Working Families Tax Credit, that childcare will be a cash advantage where you get £105 top whack actually towards childcare. Will that help? Again, on the face of it, yeah, it does look as though it will help because if we get help with after-school care because of the ages of our children, it will enable George to go to work. So, you know, we should be better off that way. Thank you both very much. Let's move on up the street now to the next door house. Uh, and here we find that we have a, I think, a pensioner couple. Yes, from Lowestoft, Jim and Peggy Hodges. Jim and Peggy, this is your new uh, balance sheet for the week. Direct tax, 96 pence richer. That's because uh, thresholds are up. The age allowance is up too. Indirect tax, pound twenty-six. Worse off, you drive a car. Petrol's gone up quite a lot, isn't it, Jim? How about that? It has indeed gone up quite a lot. That's going to be disastrous for those of our, our pensioners live out in the country. But quite honestly, Peter, I'm very disappointed with the budget because they have carried on exactly as the Tories did. They are ripping off the pensioners. We're still stuck on the retail price index. Oh, you mean and we should be put back on the wages. You're, you're, better, you're better off as a result of this budget, uh, Jim. Ripping you off. They've ripped us off because by the retail price index, but if we run the wages index, Peter, because we paid national insurance on the wages index, my income would be something like another 40 quid a week. I'm sorry, yes, when I said you were but better off, I mean, you're better that, off in... They don't want you're, to you're, you're better off in, in direct tax terms. You are, of course, worse off overall because you drive that car. Um, do you think perhaps you should drive the car a little less? And what about getting a smaller car that might attract a smaller road fund licence? Well, I have got a smaller car, that will affect me, but there was a catch in it, Peter, which you've overlooked. Right. A smaller and fuel-efficient car. Now, a lot of pensioners run cars at the baby C, D, E registrations, and they're not because they, they, they weren't designed for it. it it's a, it, it sounded good, the budget. There's nothing in it. It's a waste of time. The more things alter, the more they remain the same. Peggy, do I see you nodding at that? <laughs> you agree <laughs> with it? <laughs> All right, thanks. We better move on. Thank you both very much for joining us. Okay, let's move up the street a bit then to the uh, next house. And here now we are on uh, average earnings, I think roughly, yes. So we're in London with uh, Ashok and Shashi Gupta. Uh, and the details for you, Ashok and uh, Shashi, your roughly average earnings, £23,000 a year. They run a retail shop, so their earnings are in fact shop takings and profit in the shop. Direct tax change, £1 richer. Indirect tax, £1.63 poorer. Worse off by 63 uh, pence a week. Again, you drive a car, don't you, Ashok? 
Yes, we do. Hence, yeah. hence the indirect tax is going to hit you. Now, what about the shop? What about the effect of all these tax changes on, on your retail business? Well, you see, the cigarettes are mostly what we worried mostly. Well, first you put the 20p up on a cigarette, yes. Now, the most of the lot of cigarettes are coming from the continent. Now, before he put the price up or 20p, he should stop do something about it. Stop the cigarette coming to the country from a uh, continent. You okay, see? I'm going to have to move on, Ashok. But thank you for that. It's not going to help the retail business. I understand that. Let's move on up the street no, now to the he, he, better off family. Still, thirty-five thousand pounds a year. And here we're joined uh, by uh, a couple from, I think, Leicester. Yes, it's David and Elizabeth Winterton. David and Elizabeth Winterton. Here is your new balance sheet up the right here. Thirty-five thousand pounds a year, direct tax. Better off or indirect tax? Worse off? Just worse off by six pence a week. That's because you drive a, a, a pretty expensive car, isn't it, uh, David? What do you think of the budget in general? There seems to be a lot of packaging in my eyes and not much content. Uh, lots of gimmicks. Uh, very cynical, soft option, putting fuel up all round. You know, it's the same old trick again. And uh, I don't think uh, it's, it's going to help many people a lot. The working family tax thing worries me because of the burden of administration, et cetera, on the small businesses. All right, let's move straight on, David. Sorry to cut you off so quickly there, but, we, but time is against us. I just want to talk very quickly uh, to our best off family uh, in the street, Alan and Michelle Finch of Newcastle. Uh, Alan and Michelle, here is your new balance sheet. I don't know if you can see that, £100,000 a year is your joint income. Direct tax, £9.36. Better off, it's because the thresholds are up. You uh, pay less tax at 40%. Indirect tax, £4.13. Worse off, that's of course the petrol and so on. You're better off by £5.23 a week. You seem to come off rather well, uh, Alan. Well, it's, they've just shifted the books around, really, haven't they? He's, been a, he's a good accountant. I mean, all right, it's costing you an extra uh, 25 quid uh, a month, I would reckon. Uh, I'll get it back in another way. But, uh, it's, because the public hasn't worked out yet. It's better exactly. I'm not hearing you terribly well. Michelle, Michelle, c c just a quick word. Well, perhaps this could be one of... I think we're not, we're not hearing you too well, but thank you both very much. You don't like this budget very much. I heard that much anyway. So, David, there we have the general view of people. Not a very exciting budget for most of them, but clearly they are prepared to look very hard, particularly the lower paid, uh, at what this working family tax credit comes up with. Thank you very much, Peter. But, Mario Elms, what do you make of that, uh, the effect on those six families or so? I mean, how well judged is the targeting by the government of this budget? Yeah, it doesn't seem to be very well judged at all. Certainly the people who've gained the most are those with children, um, but there's some fairly uh, lowly paid or, or on-benefit families there who aren't excessive in their you know, car fuel consumption and, or, 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 yeah, or on the other face things. It, they weren't doing particularly well. They weren't doing very well at all, and yet the, the wealthiest family... At the very top family, end, they got another six yeah, quid. They yeah. were doing quite well. Let's see how, uh, how Swans has reacted now that they've had a bit more time to digest this. Di program? Diana Medill, can you hear me? Diana? I can indeed, Good. David. Yes, indeed, we can hear you. Here in Swansea, we're very interested in the environmental measures that Gordon Brown was talking about, not least Gordon James here from Friends of the Earth. Does it make for a much greener Britain? No, I'm afraid that it doesn't. There are a few small steps in the right direction. For instance, we're pleased that he's reduced the, the tax on labour so to help people to get back to work, and he's slightly increased the tax on pollution and waste. We wish that the tax on waste would have been extended to cover incineration, and uh, we wish that the reduction on VAT for energy-saving materials would apply not just to 40,000 people, but to the 8 million people who suffer fuel poverty in Britain. So there are small steps in the right direction, but a great deal more will have to be done if the government is to achieve its 20% reduction in the main greenhouse gas carbon dioxide, and if the government is to reduce the, uh, the appalling effects on health of, of road pollution. Okay. Hugh Richards, you're a farmer. Do you think that the government is taking to a, into account a rural community such as this and drawing up these environmental measures? Well, it has to uh, some extent. Uh, my concern is uh, at the start I was interested in doing something as far as the strength of Sterling. He hasn't done anything as far as I can see. Very much a spin doctor type budget uh, with very much headline statements. Even on the environment? Well, even on the environment. The, the, the sort of the danger la lies in the details that could come out in the course of the, the next few weeks. The argument about the fine print once again. What about you, Elspeth Garrett? Uh, you're involved in a South Wales transport company. I agree that it's all headline stuff and although he has promised an increase in fuel rebate, he hasn't specified how much, nor has he specified how the five million available for public transport over the next three years is going to be spent. But he's trying to get cleaner cars, cleaner engines on the road. I don't think he's taken strong enough measures to ensure that that will happen. So what would you like to see? How would that work? What I would like want? to see 100% um, 
uh, fuel rebate for public transport. And um, I will await the finer details later this week with interest. Jill Lewis, you're a, you're a businesswoman, you've got a global insurance business, but what about company car tax and the way that that's been tackled by the government? Do you think it's fair? Uh, I must admit I lost sleep last night and thought it was going to affect me far more adversely than it has done. Um, so I am a little relieved. Um, the fact that my car parking space won't be taxed is another bonus. Um, and I think my, my overall organisation will be relieved from that point of view So too. he shied away from some of the measures he, he has, could have. Jill, has, thank yes. you very much indeed. And now back to David again. Diana, thanks very much. So one of the key things for the politicians is how this is all going to be treated in headline form in the newspapers. We're joined by two newspaper men, Piers Morgan first of all, the editor of The Mirror. Mr Morgan, good afternoon. How are you going to, what are you going to say about this tomorrow? I think we're going to be broadly positive, certainly uh, for a number of our readers, thousands if not millions in the low income bracket. I think it's pretty good news. As you can see by our page one that we're planning for tonight, uh, we're taking the view that the, the main thrust of this is very much to get back to work. If what does that actually say? Your country needs you back at work? Yeah, I mean we've got sort of rather Kitchener-like expression of Gordon Brown. But I think, I think certainly his main thrust appears to be to get people uh, on low income uh, into better shape, uh, who, without jobs, back to work, disabled, who want to work, back to work, women who want to work, back to work. I think in that way it's very positive. I mean, obviously you can be churlish, you can pick holes in the fact that, uh, from my perspective, he probably hasn't given quite enough money into the National Health Service. I would like to have seen perhaps the, the top end of the pay sector clobbered a bit more uh, and more given to, to public funding. But I think that would be churlish. I think what he's trying to do is say, look, I'm going to get to grips with the bottom end of the pay sector and I want people back to work. And we should, we should really be appreciative of that. And you don't think there's an element of sort of Puritan coercion there? Oh, I think probably there is, but I think we probably could do with it. I mean, we, okay. all, know, we all know there's a number of scroungers, scroungers out there. He's trying to get them back. But he's also saying to those who are genuinely disabled or genuinely lone parents who need to stay at home, you can. Thanks very much. Anatole Kolesky. Kolesky, sorry, is a, is a columnist on The Times. Mr Kolesky. How's the Times going to play this budget tomorrow? Well, um, I'm not the editor of the Times, unfortunately, so uh, I'm not exactly sure what headline we're going to choose for it, uh, uh, although I can speak b both for myself and, I think, for the paper in saying that uh, we're going to give it a pretty positive, upbeat response. Uh, I think uh, it's been a fairly remarkable budget in that it has achieved a number of measures that Gordon Brown was pretty intent on achieving, particularly helping the lower paid and getting them into work. At the same time, it hasn't hit the middle classes and the high earners nearly as much as I think uh, many had feared. So you're, you're uh, thinking he's done all right by the economy generally as well as all right by the, the measures that he's taken? I think given what he wanted to do, he has done quite all right for the economy. I think some aspects of the economy are going to be hurt by the budget because ironically it will be in a sense too popular, not just with the public but with the financial markets. And I think it will increase the upward pressure on sterling. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see the pound appreciate considerably over the next few days and that of course will make life more difficult for exporters. Mr. Kolecki, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we're joined lastly here uh, where we came in with the politics with uh, Robin Oakley, the BBC's political editor. We started uh, this afternoon talking about the fuss that went on between number 10 and number 11 about this budget and Gordon Brown wanted to be radical and Tony Blair saying no, no, you mustn't go too far, you mustn't go too fast and all that. How has it panned out in your view? I mean, is, uh, who won? <laughs> well, I, I think the degree of dissension between Prime Minister and Chancellor is being a, a little bit overdone. They are very much engaged together in the whole modernisation project. Their own people who do the harm they because they're the ones who always time hype time. it up, isn't it? Indeed. But, I mean, I think the general feeling in the Labour Party is that yeah. Gordon Brown has brought off the trick uh, of helping the poor, putting the focus on getting people back into work without frightening the middle classes too much. But the Tories are saying, where are all the jobs going to come from? Uh, all very well having encouragements for people to work rather than be on benefits. Where are the jobs going to come from with growth figures that are uh, posited not ever to rise in the course of this Parliament to the level they were that the Tories left them? And the Tories are also pointing out that on the government's own figures here, uh, tax as a proportion of GDP is going to continue to rise throughout this Parliament. Well, the middle classes aren't going to like that. Is he going to be able to hold the, um, his own backbenchers and the Liberal Democrats we heard about and their complaints that not enough's being done on the National Health Service and Education and that he's stacking money away to pay off the national debt and he should be doing what old Labour would have done, which is to spend it on 
yes, I think there is going to be beds and schools. There'll be continued irritation on that front. I was talking to a former Tory cabinet minister just as before I came across from the Commons, and he was saying, "Well, where is all the money for health and edu education? There really ought to be more money for health and education with the kind of revenues the government's getting in." So, if uh, old-fashioned Tories are saying that, certainly it's going to be said a great deal louder on the Labour benches, and they're going to look at these figures and say that's not nearly enough. And certainly the Liberal Democrats will continue their promise but, to keep harrying them on. Uh, this. And do you believe Gordon Brown when he says he wants to keep? on this course and do you expect him not to open the floodgates uh, before I, the election or are you a cynic about that? I, I shall continue believing him until about 18 months before the election and then like every other chancellor he will have the sacred duty of winning his party an election and this is a, a government that is obsessed with the idea of winning two terms and he will do like any other chancellor what is necessary to ensure that. Well, Puritanism and probity but uh, only for the time being. I think so. <laughs> OK, Robin Oakley, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all of you for coming in and discussing this budget. Um, complicated measures, as we said. A lot, no doubt, tomorrow and over the next few days will be clearer. But what we do know for the moment is, in the Chancellor's words, that his aim is to make work pay from all of us here. Good afternoon. <laughs>